All right, hello everybody, and welcome to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am ready for more discussion of Arendil was a Mariner. <clears throat> Who knows? Maybe we'll get through the poem, the rest of the poem tonight. It could happen. We only have four stanzas. Now, it's true that we've never done more than three stanzas in a sitting, but uh, I'm feeling good about it, so we will... Uh, We'll see how we do. Um, all right. Um, and yes, uh, our first announcement tonight is absolutely Middle Moot is coming up. I see Aslan's Compass and uh, Roan of Gondor. I think both of you are going to be there uh, this weekend. I'm excited. And uh, Mad Violinist, I know, is coming. And um, uh, several other uh, folks who are, uh, uh, I think, around here this weekend, uh, or sorry, I mean tonight, uh, are going to be there this weekend. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that should be uh, that should be pretty cool. Yeah, Mad Violinist, I know. Actually, we've already begun the collaboration with the Prancing Pony guys uh, on the crossover, <laughs> and it turns out shockingly that they're gonna they're they've passed us sooner than. Uh, uh, sooner than, uh, than we, we, I guessed a couple months ago, but it's all good. It's all good. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we're totally not get I, I can promise you we're not getting to the council first because see, unlike us, the prancing pony guys or unlike me, let me take personal responsibility for this. The prancing pony guys are super organized. They're like ridiculously organized. Okay. Um, like they have everything planned out in advance. They know, like, ask them, like, what um, what chapters or, like, what pages of what chapter will you be releasing an episode on on, like, February, you know, the the third week of February 2020, and they'll be able to tell you, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, no, we, we, it's not how we roll here in Exploring the Lord of the Rings. But it's close. We're, you know, uh, we're going to be, when, it, when we come to the crossover point with the Prancing Pony guys, um, uh, the, of course, the Prancing Pony podcast is also doing a read through of the Lord of the Rings with somewhat more rapidity than we're doing. Um, so we're celebrating the crossover. Um, both of us are big uh, sort of mutual fans of each other's podcasts. So we're celebrating the crossover. Uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the time when they pass us and leave us in the dust uh, by doing crossover episodes. So yeah, so the, the two of them are going to be joining uh, me here for Exploring the Lord of the Rings on the first Tuesday of November, and uh, I'm going to be uh, joining them on the episode that's going to be released that same week. I think it's the 5th is the scheduled release date. I'm not sure 100% of that, but um, but yeah, so... So that will be uh, that will be good. Mad Violinist, my question is just whether we're going to get even to the end of the poem <laughs> before then. We might do, especially since, remember, after this is our third week on this poem. But are there two more versions of this poem I want to talk about still? So, you know, it's uh, we still have some time to do. But I think um, I think I, I'm feeling good. We might actually get to a prose section uh, uh, by the time we by the time we cross over with them uh, and they come and visit us uh, on our show. So it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Um, but um, yeah, so we'll we'll, um, we'll see. And at Middlemoot this weekend, I hope at so I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna happen. It may end up being a little bit spontaneous, uh, like. I'll see when we have enough people and chairs in a sufficiently quiet room uh, for me to uh, be able to stream it. But we're gonna. I'm planning to do a semi-spontaneous streaming of a reenactment of the seating arrangements. We're totally gonna do that at Middle Moot. Uh, try to sort this out. Uh, so those of you who are regulars here uh, in the class sessions uh, and who are also gonna be at Middle Moot can can kind of help me coordinate that. Um, We'll see. We might end up doing it in a restaurant. I hope we won't have to kick other people off their tables to make this happen, but we'll see. I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work. We might sneak off into a side room uh, uh, on campus there. We'll see. Maybe we'll do it at lunchtime. No idea. Uh, but uh, at some point or other, that reenactment is going to happen. So folks who are not there are going to have to kind of stay on their toes, uh, watch for their Twitch notifications, which, hey, is a great reason to make sure that you're following the Signum U Twitch channel so that you can, because you never know when a spontaneous Lord of the Rings reenactment is going to break out at Middlemoot. So there you go. I can't. Can you be 
Can you be Arwen? Aslan's compass, you can totally be Arwen. That's great. That's, that's I remind me that I said that on Saturday. You can be our one. Oh wait, no, you'd rather be Gorfindel. Hey, okay, you know, for calling dibs, we can, we can call dibs. Um, uh, it'll be it'll be good. Chris, you want to be a boulder again? <laughs> you were a boulder in the last reenactment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, uh, Tim, probably Saturday, and I have no idea what time. Maybe Friday? No, Arwen's totally there. Arwen's going to be in the reenactment of the seating arrangements. Yeah, we're, we will have the a special canopied chair for Arwen and everything. It'll be good. Um, we, we, do we need cushions brought? We 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 may not. We we could probably do without the cushions, but uh, but but, but we'll say I don't want anyone to have to pack extra cushions. You know, have like a separate checked bag just for the cushions. But um, but yeah, it's true. Um, Carita, uh, someone else will be joining, you know, you and Robbie in this elite group, right, of uh, people who have portrayed Frodo in one of our reenactments. Of course, Carita, it might, maybe Robbie will do it again, right? Maybe she'll she'll call dibs on that, but uh, uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, and I, yeah, so I can't give further details on that because I don't know them yet. We'll see what happens. Um, but um anyhow um let's uh oh yeah um, other announcements so middle moot this weekend now uh if you are in range of middle moot that is if you are um uh if you're within driving range of waterloo iowa you can still come it's the registration is still open um you should definitely register in the next day or two uh uh in order to make sure to uh uh, to get your lunch order in, but you're up until Saturday. Uh, and this Saturday, of course, for those who are listening asynchronously is October 12th, 2019. Um, so, uh, yeah, but definitely, uh, time to get on that if there's still, uh, uh, if you're, if you're able to get there. And, um, we also are, we're looking at, uh, Magnolia Moot, uh, uh, coming up very soon. Our registration has been, uh, sort of late to come on that one. Um, but we're looking at the last weekend of October, uh, for Magnolia Moot. So we're going to be getting together down in the Charlotte area. I've been talking about that and the, um, the date I believe is fixed. So we're, we're, we've been having issues with the venue there, but we, I think have that sorted out now. Um, so we should have the registration open for that, uh, uh, fairly, quickly, I think. Um, and, uh, the other things I wanted to mention uh, this Thursday, uh, the Mythgard movie club is meeting again, and they're going to be discussing Pan's Labyrinth, which is a super cool movie. So uh, if you want to talk about Pan's Labyrinth, that's Thursday night at 8 30 PM, uh, Eastern time. And that, uh, uh, will be, uh, there's, uh, uh, links for that. You can join, uh, the discussion there on, um, uh, so again, go to signumuniversity.org and scroll down a little bit and there should be a, a little event page for that. Um, and, um, uh, yeah. So let's see other announcements. When I feel like I'm forgetting something else. Uh, no, no, that's it. Good. Okay. I just did them in a different order, which is why I thought there were still more. Okay, cool. Um, so that is the uh, that are the announcements. And of course, to remind you that our fall fundraiser is still going on. So if you haven't had a chance yet to uh, make a contribution to donate, uh, make a tax free donation uh, to uh, a tax deductible, even better uh, donation to Signum University, um, there is still definitely time to do that. Um, we're doing uh, uh, very, very well. Our goal is $70,000 uh, by the end of the year for the annual fund. And we now have almost $45,000 in, um, uh, in uh, gifts and pledges. Uh, so that is uh, uh, really, really awesome. We're uh, a big percentage of the way there now. Um, so everything that you can do uh, to help for that would be great. You can give a one-time donation. You can make uh, a monthly, you can start a, a monthly donation, even small monthly donations really add up over time and uh, make a big contribution. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, again, so Simon, $70,000 is the goal for the whole year. Um, uh, so that's a really, uh, um, uh, a really uh, good uh, portion uh, of uh, the way there so far. So yeah, um, we're doing, uh, we are doing great on that. Um, and I was going to say something else about that. Oh, yes, I remember what it was. So also don't forget uh, that you can enter a, um, um, 
you can enter. We're going to do a special drawing uh, to I guess just sort of as another way to uh, thank our donors. So if you've made a donation or if you have a monthly donation, uh, which is continuing, then you can uh, enter our drawing. So send an email to donate at signumu.org and just mention that you want to be entered in the Exploring the Lord of the Rings drawing uh, and we will enter you into the drawing. And on the day of the campaign finale, which is uh, the weekend after next, so Saturday the 19th, uh, we'll be doing drawings. We'll draw three winners and the three winners will get uh, their choice of uh, access to any of the course materials from any of the courses in our catalog, you know, from one of the courses, any one of the courses in our catalog. Uh, and um, they will also, the grand prize winner uh, will get to uh, do a special session with me in exploring the Lord of the Rings, either joining me uh, on the field trip or having a, a separate discussion or uh, whatever. So, uh, yeah, donate at signumu.org. Correct. That is the, uh, that is the uh, correct address. That is right. Um, and yes, Arden Crayon, Signum U has no physical location. It is one of the missions of Signum University never to own real estate and thus keep our costs very low, which enables us to make our tuition prices way lower than is normal in higher education. Um, absolutely. Uh, we are a completely virtual institution. We are a totally cloud-based really hip digitally native 21st century university that's uh that's us and so naturally we focus on tolkien studies and germanic philology like most of the like really cool hip uh uh you know digitally native folks it's what we do medieval stuff mostly you know it's cool um all right excellent um that i think was all of my uh uh, was all of my announcements. So let us go. We've got one question before we, uh, uh, one question before we get back to the text. Um, and that comes from Matt. I wanted to, there was a big discussion about this on the discussion board, um, which I'm not going to be able to encapsulate, but I wanted to, uh, bring this up. Thank you, Matt, for posting that. I know I asked you last week to do that. Um, uh, is the question is about, so, Th remembering the ring verse, right? And I'm just quoting the end of it here. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. So here's the question. What is meant by to find them? Initially, I thought it was that the one somehow finds the ring of power uh, and draws them and their wearers under the dominion of the one. You can't start to dominate if you don't know where the dominated is. In our discussion of the manner by which the One Ring influences others, however, I began to suspect that was insufficient. After all, if the One is impacting people across time as well as space, the need to locate becomes less important. Uh, great. And there, again, as I said, there was a lot of discussion on this. My primary thought... So, I agree with, I think, it, uh, I think, Flamifer, it was you who were saying, uh, sort of talking about the, the sequence. I agree with you that it makes sense to think, if we think of the sequence find them, bring them, bind them, right? If we think of the verbs in sequence, it does seem like first you locate them, right? Then you bring them in and then you chain them up, right? It kind of seems like a, a sort of a logical um, uh, uh, sequence there, right? But I, in the, at the end of the day, I don't actually think that that, again, that's, that's very sensible, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, I don't think it works that way. And the primary way I don't think it works that way is it starts with rule them. Right. Which seems to me to mess up the chronology. Exactly. Belong spawn technically rule them as first. Um, and so my primary thought here is that I do not think if we think of finding them in a purely like geographic sense, like if we imagine that one of the that this means that one of the functions uh, of the rings of power uh, is or like of the ring of power, sorry, of the one ring, uh, is like as a kind of like, you know, sonar locator uh, of the other rings of power. Um, I think that that's untrue. Um, that I, I just don't think that that works at all. And I think we have counter evidence of that, in fact. Um, for instance, we know that um, the, the Dark Lord does not seem to know where the seven are, for instance. Um, I mean, he pursues 
Thrain, but only after Thrain exposes himself, only after Thrain reveals himself. Um, the Dwarven Ring of, I mean, the, the Longbeard's Ring, I mean, um, Thror had it for ever so long, right? And then Thran had it. Um, so, I mean, it's been out there. It's been in their family for quite some time. Um, and even quite some time, you know, a, a good bit of time elapses, even just between when they leave Erebor uh, and when they uh, uh, and when Thran is finally captured, so it is possible um, that uh, you know you could maybe argue, well, like as long as Thror had the ring, but was still in Erebor, you know, in like his own sort of place of power, Sauron didn't move against him then, but you know began to kind of move in uh, afterwards. Um, anyway, that's um, um, that's. Even that doesn't work because, again, the amount of time that they were all refugees between when Smaug attacks and when the ring is finally taken from Thran is quite some time, right? Um, now, you're right, Sauron doesn't have the one at that point, but why didn't he, 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 again, the dwarven rings were out for the whole time, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't bring them, like, why didn't he even let the dragons consume them, right? I mean, there was a lot of time, um, uh, between when the rings of power were made and when the the one was taken away from Sauron. You're right that the, the Erebor timeline doesn't matter, but the, my point is that's at the tail end of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that that, uh, I really don't think that it comes into it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a sonar locator. I really don't. And here's the primary thing. Remember that they hid them, like they had to take the, th the, the primary evidence that we have for this is the three rings, right? We know that the three were removed, like they took them off, uh, and they started to, and they, they concealed to try to conceal them from the enemy, right? Here's what I keep going back to. I keep going back to actually not even, uh, a, a, a reference in the Lord of the Rings. What I keep going back to is a reference to the Silmarillion, which is paralleled in, um, the Lord of the Rings. And that is a reference to the fact that between uh, Melian and Melkor, right? When Morgoth wants to, like, seek Melian's mind, but Melian shields her mind from Morgoth. He can't, he doesn't know exactly what's going on with her, right? She's able to sort of hold him off. And there's a, there's a very close parallel uh, to that moment in The Lord of the Rings when Galadriel says, like that he, you know, he seeks to know, but still it's, but still, but still it's shut, right? She is keeping Sauron out, right? Now, again, he doesn't have the one ring. If he did, he, she wouldn't be able to keep him out if, because she's wearing the one, she's wearing her ring, right? One of the three rings. Um, when he says, so when he says find them again, I don't think it's about geographical location. I think it is, they would be revealed to him. Remember also that moment, and again, this is not exactly the same kind of thing, but remember all that moment, uh, also that moment when um, Sam puts on the ring and doesn't feel invisible, but he feels horribly and uniquely visible, right? Remember the moment on Amon Hen when Frodo is wearing the ring, right? And, uh, uh, and the eye is searching for him, right? And he wearing the ring would be revealed to Sauron. Now, again, it's not the same. It's not the one ring seeking out the other rings. But when I, when I try to like figure to myself what, um, uh, when I, when I try to figure to myself what the, how this kind of thing seems to work, like when we think about finding in the context of this, of this verse, again, it could mean geographically locating them. It's possible that it could mean that. But again, I don't think that that's what that means because that does not seem to be the force of things. It is more about the finding. And this was, uh, and here I'm agreeing with, Several of the other people, I think Anthony maybe, and uh, and and a couple others. It was a long discussion, as I say, um, but who were sort of thinking about the more archaic uh, definitions and senses of find. Um, uh, again, I think it is more about for them to be uh, their minds to be laid open, to be laid bare, um, their purposes, their minds, their wills to be laid bare and open to Sauron. Right. That's how he will find them. Um, and he would bring them and he would bind them in the darkness. Just as I don't think that find them is a geographical reference, you know, that he's like putting on the ring and he's like, mm, 
Lothlorien, go! Right? I don't think that's the point. First he finds them, he's like, Galadriel, I see you. Right? Uh, your mind is open to me. This is like the theoretical thing that I think what it would mean, what it would look like for Galadriel. Um, Galadriel, I see you. Right? Um, your mind is open to me. And he's going to bring them. Does that mean bring them geographically to Mordor? Eh, I don't necessarily think so. Right. I mean, again, you can say, well, logically, right. Uh, and bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Right. But again, I don't think that that, that these verses are working. I think it's, this is all kind of, this whole thing I think is much more metaphorical is much more abstract than I think it sounds. Um, Sauron's goal is not to have everything in Mordor. Like, not everybody is going to come and live with him in Mordor. He is going to move out and take over the whole rest of Middle-earth, right? So, it's not he's not literally going to chain everybody up uh, to locate people, bring them back to Mordor, and chain them up there, right? Um, the sense in which he is going to bring them into the darkness is a much more profound sense, Right? And the sense in which he's going to bind them is going to be a much more metaphorical sense as well, right? They're going to be bound. They're going to be enslaved to him like the ringwraiths are enslaved, right? The ringwraiths are also bound. They're not chained up, right? But they're bound much more. So again, I think, is he going to find them? Yeah. But again, it's not about location. It's more than that. Is he going to bring them? Maybe, literally, but it's going to be more than that, right? He's going to gather them into the darkness, right? He's going to bring them from where they are and from what they're doing into his shadow, understood generally, right? And in that darkness, he's going to bind them. Um, remember that in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie, is kind of a framing mechanism for the second half of this verse, right? For the second, for the second half of this poem. Um, uh, it's not just the completion of the sentence. I mean, again, it all kind of works together, but it's not about, uh, again, necessarily literally bringing everybody to Mordor and keeping them there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Rinrus, exactly. I, I certainly don't think that his plan is to, you know, his original plan was to have like Celebrimbor and Gilgalad and Galadriel all chained up, right? Uh, in his, uh, uh, in, you know, in his basement or something. Um, yeah, Tora Marthen, exactly. If Sauron wins, it, it won't matter where you are. So again, the finding, it really seems to me uh, to be the actual, um, uh, the revelation of their minds, right? The control over their minds, um, the exposure of their minds to him. Um, remember, Celebrimbor is aware of him. The thing that he, Sauron, seems to miscalculate, which exposes the whole plot, is that there seems to be a little bit of feedback, right? Uh, there seems to be a little bit more two-way there than he thought that there would be. Uh, because when Sauron puts on his ring and, you know, chants his verse, um, Celebrimbor is aware of it, right? Sauron's mind is open to Celebrimbor. Um, so again, it's almost like he's opened up a two-way channel and Sauron didn't realize it was going to be a two-way channel, right? So in that sense, Belongsman, Sauron is found, right? Celebrimbor finds Sauron, finds him out, right? Um, and it sort of finds him uh, in this, uh, uh, in the more archaic sense of the word found. Um, and again, that's why, I, again, I think that with Celebrimbor, we see in action, uh, kind of in reverse, right? Again, sort of unexpectedly to Sauron, the way that I think that that finding would have worked or, or what it sort of means. Um, but so anyway, that's why, as I say, I don't think it's, um, um, I don't think that, and, and, the, and what happens with the, uh, with the dwarf rings, again, to me, it suggests that it's not because we know that he wants to recall them, right? The seven rings uh, of the dwarven kings, and he doesn't succeed in doing that. Um, um, he eventually gets some of the dwarf rings uh, back, but he had time. He had some time to do that. I mean, he immediately goes to war with Celebrimbor, but that war, uh, there's 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 time between that war uh, and uh, the end of this. I mean, there's, there's, how long is it? Somebody give me the dates. I don't remember off the top of my head. What are the, what are the, what are the second age dates? Somebody find for me, 
in Appendix B, what is the date of like the death of Celebrimbor? You know, that when 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 Sauron wages war with with the elves of Eregion, the sacking of Eregion, and then the distance in time between that and the end of the Second Age, between that and the Battle of the Last Alliance. Um, because I'm pretty sure it's quite some time. Uh and I he wants to recall the dwarf rings if if the one ring just served as like an echo locator for the uh for the rings of power he has lots and lots of time uh to do that i'm pretty sure so um yeah yeah Skudo says that Sauron seems to be the poster child for unintended consequences. Uh, everything he does, uh, from the Silmarillion on down to the final chapter in The Lord of the Rings, has completely unexpected results. Yeah, oh, it's true. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. Eregion is laid waste in 1697, uh, Edith says. Good, good. And what's the date uh, of the downfall of Numenor? I know it's not the same, and there's some time between that. There's, there's, there's a little bit of time between that and the the battle, the War of the Last Alliance, when he's um, overthrown. But it's quite a bit of time. Even if you take out the time, we know he set his ring aside when he went to Numenor, so he didn't bring the ring to Numenor with him. Um, okay, thirty three nineteen. There you go. Right, and the War of the, of the Last Alliance starts in thirty four thirty four. Um, so yeah, you're looking at 1500 years, 1600 years, right? Um it's uh it's I get plenty of time to use the echolocation feature of the one ring uh to find all of the dwarf rings that he wanted to find, right? Um but he doesn't. So again, I just um uh, exactly. Thousands of years, nothing much of note happened, Boomful. Exactly. He had plenty of free time, right, in order to track down Dwarvish rings if he wanted to. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, um, yeah, it's interesting, Matt. It might be, Matt is saying it might be less that Sauron didn't know it would be a two-way connection uh, and, and more Sauron just underestimating Celebrimbor and all the rest of them. Yeah. No, I mean, that's very possible. I mean, underestimating folks, that's also a pattern uh, of Sauron's no question. Uh, we certainly saw that uh, all over the place with the Hobbits and the Ring Wraiths, right? Um, by the way, that is still one of my favorite things. Uh, you know, if I had to make a list of, like, my favorite things that have emerged from exploring the Lord of the Rings, uh, it is the series of realizations, right? Uh, not just from Weathertop, really from Bree, especially on, um, even earlier, frankly, um, thinking through things from the ring rates point of view more thoroughly as we did, as we went through, um, and seeing how systematically they underestimate the hobbits and how, um, pointedly they are shown, their underestimations are shown to be wrong, I think is really cool. Um, yeah. Mornowin, that's a really good point, too. The three rings were the ones that Sauron had never touched, so it's possible that he didn't really know what they were capable of. He might have underestimated. It's another way uh, in which, as Matt suggests, he might have been underestimating Celebrimbor, right? Um, not realizing that the rings that Celebrimbor had made would enable him uh, to uh, uh, be aware of Sauron when he claimed the dominion over them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, that's my thoughts about finding, um, that like, you know, so do I think he's literally finding them in a sense? Yes, of course. But again, I don't think it, I, what I don't think that it refers to is literal geographic location any more than I think the binding refers to literal chaining up, um, or necessarily the bringing them into the darkness means literal transportation to Mordor. Um, uh, and of course that's suggested in part by like the fact that we know that Frodo is going to be physically transported to Mordor. But again, that's different. He is the bearer of the one ring, which Sauron wants conveyed to him in Mordor very much, right? Um, a different kind of situation. Um, yeah. Okay. But thank you, Matt, for that question. That is an excellent question. May <laughs> I have a kind of suspicion that this might be how we end up going back and, and doing like 
the early chapters more justice than we did at, at the first time is that people going back and asking questions uh, continually about chapters one and two until we cover all the things we might have covered. Had we actually done them at a reasonable pace? Uh, who knows? All right. Let us go back to the poem. Uh, I'm going to, as I did before, um, just start off by reading through um, the whole thing, and then we'll get up to stanza five is where we are. We read through stanzas one through four uh, 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 by the end of last time, but I'm, so I'll read through the ones we did again, and then we'll stop when we get there. A Arendel was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. He built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathil to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made, her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. In panoply of ancient kings and chained rings he armoured him, his shining shield was scored with runes to ward all wounds and harm from him. His bow was made of dragon horn, his arrows shorn of ebony, of silver was his haberjan, his scabbard of chalcedony. His sword of steel was valiant, of adamant his helmet tall, an eagle plume upon his crest, upon his breast an emerald. Beneath the moon and under star he wandered far from northern strands, bewildered on enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. From gnashing of the narrow ice where narrow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far away, at last he came to night of naught, and passed, and never sight he saw, of shining shore nor light he sought. The winds of wrath came driving him, and blindly in the foam he fled, from west to east and errandless, unheralded he homeward sped. There flying Elwing came to him, and flame was in the darkness lit, more bright than light of diamond the fire upon her carcanet. The Silmaril she bound on him, and crowned him with the living light, and dauntless then with burning brow he turned his prow, and in the night from other world beyond the sea there strong and free a storm arose, a wind of power in Tarmanel. By paths that seldom mortal goes, his boat it bore with biting breath as might of death across the grey and long forsaken seas distressed. From east to west he passed away. Okay, now here's where we're picking up again. Through ever night he back was borne, on black and roaring waves that ran, or leagues unlit and foundered shores that drowned before the days began. No, we did this one last time too, sorry. <laughs> I'll start it again. Through ever night he back was borne, on black and roaring waves that ran, or leagues unlit and foundered shores that drowned before the days began, until he heard on strands of pearl, where ends the world, the music long, where ever foaming billows roll, the yellow gold and jewel. Wan. He saw the mountain silent rise where twilight lies upon the knees of Valinor, and Eldemar beheld afar beyond the seas. A wanderer escaped from night to Haven White, he came at last to Elvenholm, the green and fair, where keen the air, where pale as glass, beneath the hill of Ilmarin, a glimmer in a valley sheer, the lamplit towers of Tyrion are mirrored in the shadow mirror. Now, this is our new one. He tarried there from errantry, and melodies they taught to him, and sages old him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. They clothed him then in elven white, and seven lights before him sent, as through the Calakirian to hidden land forlorn he went. He came unto the timeless halls, where shining fall the countless years, and endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer. And words unheard were spoken then, of folk of men and elven kin, beyond the world where visions showed, forbid to those that dwell therein. Okay, what did you hear? Okay, Mad Violinist is hearing a a uh, a change in the scheme here. Let's let's uh, uh, let's look at this carefully here. He tarried there from errantry, and melodies they taught to him. Now that's a very approximate. Right. Um, there's only a very gentle assonance between errantry and melodies. Right. They taught to him and sages old him marvels told and harps of gold they brought to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's um, um, 
that's really uh, that triple rhyme is really is really good, right? We've not gotten that before. Um, the internal rhyme in the odd number lines, right? And sage is old, him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, we see it, so it's a triple trisyllable rhyme or assonance, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That's uh, kind of a big deal, right? Um, we haven't heard that. What's the effect of that now? Um, first of all, notice the rhythm is regular again. We're only pausing at the end of the lines here, and we have a period at the end of the quatrain, as we saw at the beginning of the poem, right? So the rhythm is normal, right? Um, and sage is old, him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. Um, we also have a very close terminal rhyme, taught to him and brought to him, right? Uh, very, very, uh, very tight trisyllabic rhyme at the end. Um, yeah, Simon, it is really interesting, isn't it, that they, they teach him melodies and then they bring him harps? Um, I don't think that they're necessarily expecting him to perform for them, uh, but... I mean, I guess it's kind of them if they're going to teach him songs to then, like, give him something to play the songs on, right? Um, I mean, it would be a little bit mean to be like, okay, here's a song. Too bad you can't play it, but whatever. Um, Mad Violinist, I agree. There is a really incantatory feel to this, uh, to this whole poem. Um, uh, to me, that, so that the, the way that, the internal that that the, the 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 lines right so we've got the the quatrain um is the basic unit of this poem right that's been true all the way through as is marked by the end rhymes but each of the pairs of lines within the quatrain right are uh focused on that central pivot right the the tri the trisyllabic rhyme at the end of the of the odd lines and the beginning of the even lines right is the pivot around which all of those li those line pairs work and then the quatrains tied together with those terminal rhymes uh on lines 2 and 4 um so the shift from just the pivot to having that go all the way through the lines 3 and 4 of that first quatrain in this stanza i agree is um uh creates a remarkable effect, which I don't think is coincidentally connected with the melodies that they're teaching him at the beginning, right? He tarried there from errantry, and melodies they taught to him, and sages old him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. Um... And sage is old him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. Um, it's also perfectly regular, right? Absolutely regular iambic, which has not been everywhere through, right? Um, he tarried there from errantry and melodies they taught to him, and sages old him marvels told, and harps of gold they brought to him. Right? You hear that? How regular that is? Um, I agree. Chris, I think that's a really great characterization of it. It does sound almost like an incantation, right? And notice what the incantation is about. It's about he is being given knowledge, right? He is being told stories of marvelous stories, right? Marvelous knowledge, marvelous wisdom. Um, and he's being brought harps of gold, presumably on which to play the melodies, which they just um, uh, taught to him, right? Oh, man, violence. I hadn't even noticed that. You're completely right. Um, tarried and errantry. Also, he tarried there from errantry and melodies they taught to him. Um, uh, I had been focusing on the weakness of the internal rhyme there with errantry and melodies, but you're right. Um, tarried there. Uh, yes. Tarried there from errantry and melodies they taught to him. Um, now I'm wanting to make sure we don't get that anywhere else in this stanza. They clothed him then in elven white and seven lights before him sent as through the Calakirian to hidden land forlorn he went. We're not seeing anything like it further on. He came unto the timeless halls where shining fall. Uh, endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer. 
spoken then of folk of men beyond the world where visions showed forbid to those that dwell therein yeah yeah um yeah yeah um yeah that's really cool that's really cool um The transition here, if you go back to the previous stanza, remember the previous stanza was about his arrival, right? Um, if you look at the sentences, there are what, three sentences, right? In the previous stanza, um, through ever night, he back was born, right? Um, so we've got him being born back through ever night by the, remember the wind is blowing him from the east, right? Towards the west. And he's born back through ever night through that, uh, um, uh, through the night of naught, right? And then we have, he saw the mountain silent rise. So he comes back through the night of naught and then he sees Teniquitil in front of him, right? And then the last sentence, a wanderer escaped from night to Haven White, he came at last. And we have him seeing Elvenholm beneath the hill of Ilmarin, a glimmer in a valley sheer, right? The lamplit towers of Tyrion are mirrored in the shadow mirror. So we have his coming through Evernight, seeing Teniquitil rise up before him and then seeing Elven home. And we're getting the, we're getting the, uh, the sound of the ever foaming billows rolling on the strands of pearl and all that stuff. Right. Um, so that's what just happened. Now he has arrived. And as soon as he arrives, so having arrived, right. When we first get, uh, a discussion of him here, we have this first quatrain, which has this very remarkable departure from the rhyme scheme, or not, not departure from, addition to, right? I mean, and that's new, so it is a departure in that sense, but it's not a negative departure, right? It's a positive departure. It's, it's something is added, right? More rhyme, uh, a greater richness of rhyme to this already very rhyme rich poem, right? Is being added there in those first four lines. Um, when he, uh, when we are getting a description, of uh his arrival and his what how he is received right um and absolutely fourth dauntless i do think that um tarried there is no coincidence right uh that is as fourth dauntless is recalling if we go back for a second to stanza one that's where we began a arendel was a mariner that tarried in our vernian um so tarried uh tarried in was originally rhyming with Mariner, which was identifying Arendel, and of course Arvernian, which presumably is where he lived or, you know, where he tarried, and we talked about that before, um, was associated with him at the beginning. Now he tarried there from errantry and melodies they taught to him. Um, yeah, Arden Crayon says perhaps it's emphasizing that he's a wanderer. He doesn't have a permanent home. Yes, that's certainly true. Um, uh, is there any evidence to support the idea that he is entering the world of fairy and time is changing between Valinor and his original home? I don't know if there's any evidence to state emphatically that time is altering as it sometimes does do, uh, exactly as you say, uh, between the mortal world and the world of fairy, but, um, that he has entered fairy. Yeah. That's was made super, super clear in stanza five, right? Um, the strands of pearl where ends the world, the music long, uh, wherever foaming billows roll, uh, the yellow gold and jewels wan, right? That's, um, and we, and we've had Eldemar and we've had Elven home. Yeah. He's clearly come to fairy in the West. Right. Um, so that's pretty clear. Are we supposed to understand a time shift in some sense? Is he being held in some kind of, Stasis is time passing for him that he doesn't understand how much time is there is passing. Um, possibly. Uh, it's interesting. It is interesting that the very first thing we see happening to him is tarrying, right? Is him staying as if like, again, like an indeterminate amount of time, right? He tarried there from air injury. How long does that stand to take? We, you know, we have no idea. I mean, they're teaching him, music they're telling him marvels um it um it certainly does sound like um uh, he's there for some time but who knows 
exactly. Um, uh, okay. Um, they clothed him then in elven white, and seven lights before him sent, as through the Calakirian to hidden land forlorn he went. I don't think I understand everything in this stanza, especially I don't know that I understand the seven lights. Um, when he's being sent through the Calakirian, this is on foot. Right, so this is not describing him being launched forth in his ship. We're going to get that later. Um, this is him disembarking, walking through the Calakirian to the inner part of Valinor. Right? Um, seven lights before him sent. I mean, I don't know who they are exactly. So, okay. Several words I don't fully understand um, the significance of here. I don't understand the significance of they, who exactly they are. I don't understand the significance of then. They clothed him then. So when did they clothe him? Clothe him? Like, only after they... Were the harps of gold a prerequisite? Did he have to, like, learn the melodies and play it back uh, in order to... I mean, did it... Did um, did he have to be appraised of marvels first uh, before this happened? Keep in mind, by the way, if you uh, let's cheat for a second and remember the Silmarillion. If we cheat and remember the Silmarillion, you notice that this uh, um, this contradicts the Silmarillion account, right? In the Silmarillion account, he descends from Vingalot onto the shore, and he goes in and he finds Tyrion empty, and he wanders about and is about to go back to his ship and be like, man, like, apparently there was like a plague or something, you know, this place is abandoned. Um, and then he is summoned and brought back. Right. But that's not how it happens in Bilbo's song. In Bilbo's song, the they are there from the second line. As soon as he arrives, before he disembarks, before he goes and talks to anybody, he's going to come into the timeless halls in the next quatrain after in the third quatrain of this stanza, right? Um, anyway, so, but what were they waiting for? Was the, uh, why is this sequence? Um, they clothed him then. And again, the, the other reason I don't understand the then, you could do without the then. Um, you could, um, you could say, I mean, again, it, you would need something else for the rhythm, but, you know, they clothed him in elven white and seven lights before him sent. You don't have to state a, like, that this happened then, this happened after these other things, right? Um, yeah, Matt, Matt Violinist, it does sound like a temporal separator, which is what's weird, which is what I don't get, right? Um, if you didn't have a temporal separator there, I'd be fine. Then I would just kind of understand, I could then understand those things all kind of lumped together, right? He tarried there in Errantry, meaning he was in Elvenholm for some time. While he was in Elvenholm, he did various and sundry things, including learning melodies, being told marvels, being given harps of gold, being clothed in Elven white, and also, uh, and not having told you, like, in general, many of the things he did, now let me tell you the main thing, the main deal, right? Which was the time when he went through the Calakirian and came to the Hidden Land and stuff, right? If that, that's one way in which I could understand that, and that would seem to me perfectly reasonable. But the then seems to undermine that, right? They clothed him then in elven white, as which does make it sound like what happens in the first stanza is some kind of prerequisite to being clothed in elven white and then packed on his way through the Calicarian uh, uh, to the timeless halls. Um, so... Yeah, um, Arden Cran is wondering if Elven White is the same attire given to Gandalf 2.0 in Lothlorien. Um, quite likely, wouldn't be surprised. Um, I like that theory. I hadn't thought of that, but it seems quite likely. Um,
Yeah, uh, Flamifer says maybe implies that they sent him on rather than that his quest sent him on. Um, yeah, I don't know. All that they are doing, they clothed him and seven lights before him sent. So they is the subject of the second sentence. And there's a compound verb, right? Clothed and sent. Um, but they're not sending him, they're sending the lights. They're sending the seven lights before him, right? Um, yeah, Iwendillian says, I think they're honoring his persistence. He turned around and wouldn't give up. Um, and Iwendillian, I wonder, is it also implying that he has a chance to give up before? The, I mean, so it's, I mean, the poem is stating that folks are interacting with him. Some they, right, is interacting with him on his ship before he gets out and goes through the Calicurian into Valinor, right? Um, and notice what they're doing. They're giving him stuff, right? They're teaching him melodies. They're telling him marvels. They're bringing him gifts, harps of gold, right? Um, is this some kind of test? Not, I think, again, a musical test. Like, we're going to teach you a melody, then we're going to give you a harp, and if you can't reproduce that melody, you are out, friend, right? I can't say it's impossible that that's what's happening, but I don't think it likely. Uh, instead, what I wonder is... Um, is he being almost tempted? That doesn't feel like exactly the right word. Um, almost, I would say, they were tempting him, as Boromir said, uh, in a different context. Um, that is to say, why did he come? Why did he come? He might say, like, I have an errand. You know, I, uh, I am here to, uh, to deliver my message, right, uh, to the Elder King. And they're like, oh, well, but here's some. So basically they're, they're checking to see his sincerity because he's kind of mortal. Uh, at least he's from the mortal lands. Um, the first one ever to make it here. Are they, um, um, are they basically testing to see what his resolve really is? Cause he's, this is pretty cool, right? I mean, if you go to Elven home and you are taught melodies, uh, you know, which again, remember means quite a bit, right? They're teaching him melodies. These are, there is almost got to be, um, real significance, real power to this kind of melody, right? So, okay. He's being taught melodies. He's being told marvels. So like secrets are being told to him. Uh, musics are being taught to him, uh, you know, harps of gold, which I bet the hobbits would call magic harps, are being brought to him. Um, he could go home, right, with his swag, his swag of 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 uh, power, knowledge, uh, magical gifts, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt says it feels less like a test of will and more a test of worth, akin to whether or not um, he does the equivalent of asking the grail question. Um, yeah, yeah. I, again, I, this is why I don't think temptation is quite the right word. Testing, perhaps, might be better. Um, but um, uh, anyway, he uh, seems to pass the test. What we're not told is what he does. We're just told that then, after all of those things, they clothed him in elven white and sent seven lights before him, um, which does seem to be an indication of their blessing or permission or guidance in some sense. Um, Tim Dove is wondering why harps. He can't play more than one at a time. Yeah, well, I mean, um, uh, you know, I bet he could get a mint for those on the market, right? Um uh, no, I'm semi kidding. Um, but, uh, you know, it's good, it's good to, have, I mean, if you've got a magic harp, it's good to have a spare, you know, I mean, seriously. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, no, Flamifer, I'm very resistant to the idea that they are sending him. That's not whom they're sending. They are sending the lights. He went um, is the verb that we get for him going. 
And we know that he has had his quest. He has been seeking this with great persistence, right? Um, I do think, however, that it is important that we are not told about that, right? This stanza does not... Emph this is not a... An, a look what a hero a Arendel is stanza, right? Which is really interesting. You might think that it would be, that it should be, right? Um, the first stanza kind of sounds like it might be. He tarried there from Arendry, and then look at all the stuff that happened to him, right? They taught him melodies, they told him marvels, they brought him harps of gold, they fed him peeled grapes, right? Look how, what a big deal Arendel is, right? And then you might think, if we were going to continue with that line of thinking, then the next thing to do would be to say, he resolved then to go on, despite the risk, to continue to the Elder King and, you know, uh, risk the timeless halls and, and go where no mortal was supposed to ever go, self-sacrificially, because this is what he was doing for me, for uh, folk of men and elven kin. But if you look... um uh, if you look at the rest of the stanza, it does absolutely not emphasize Eärendil's actions at any point. To hidden land forlorn he went. Even the, the he went, which does say what he did, is way at the end of the sentence, right? He came unto the timeless halls. Okay, so something else. He's doing something else. What does he do? Where shining fall the countless years and endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer, and words unheard were spoken then? This is the moment when Eärendil fulfills his great quest. And it's in the passive voice! You know, that we don't even get he, you know, we don't even get a he, much less an Eärendil. Or any kind of amplifiers, right? Emphasizing what a huge deal it is that Arendel does what he does and accomplishes what he accomplishes. Instead, it's it's put in the passive voice, which means, by definition, the passive voice conceals the doer of the action, conceals the the actual um, agent of the action. Words unheard were spoken then, of folk of men and elven kin beyond the world were visions showed, by whom, to whom. Forbid to those that dwell therein? Um, I think it's very striking. We'll come back to some of these phrases later. Um, what I'm focusing on here is this stanza should be the pinnacle of Eärendil's achievement. If the point of the poem is to celebrate what Eärendil accomplished, here's where you do it, Right? But as soon as we get, they clothed him then in elven white and seven lights before him sent as through the Calicarian to hidden land forlorn he went. Um, we're getting like we're burying the lead from there on. Because, again, I think that the lead in that stanza is a Arendel resolve to go forward. Right. That's like the only implied center of the action in that quatrain. But not only do we not get it there, again, we don't get it what happens. We don't get it in the entire rest of the stanza, right? Um, so, Mad Violinist, I absolutely agree with you. Um, again, what happens with the passive voice? Why do we get the passive voice here? Um, what the passive voice does syntactically is it lays the emphasis on the object of the action rather than on the subject. It de-emphasizes the subject of the action. This is why your English teachers always told you to never use the passive voice, a rule with which I disagree very strongly. As we're seeing in this, uh, in this stanza here, the passive voice has an important function to play, and it can be used very effectively. The reason your English teacher always told you never to use the passive voice when you were writing is that I, I was about to say nine times out of 10, but it's closer to 49 times out of 50. Um, when you're writing a paper and using the passive voice, you are being, you're either being sloppy or you're being dishonest in concealing who the doer of the action is, right? Like the way that you're usually tempted to use the passive voice when you're writing an English paper. Like, for instance, when you say things like, uh, it can be seen that, 
this, you know, conclusion happens, right? When what you really mean is, I think this, but you don't want to say that because that just makes it sound like your opinion. So you put it in the passive voice, which conceals the subject, which downplays the subject, which is you, right? Who's the one having this particular opinion or coming to this particular conclusion. And you're trying to, you're, 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 you're trying to pull up, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain thing. Right. And so that's why you're suppressing the subject and you're just trying to make it like make it sound like this conclusion is just kind of happening and uh, everybody can observe it. Right. That's why your English teacher told you that, because that's not a that's not an effective way to write. And it's not an honest way to write. Um, but of course, the passive voice has good functions. And this is one of them. It's suppressing uh, the subject, the doer of the action all the way through. What is it instead doing? And this is where I think the passive voice is the perfect vehicle for this. Um, I agree with, um, I agree with, um, Mad Violinist that the emphasis, not only of this stanza, but really of this whole poem, I think, has been not what did Arendel do, but what was done to Arendel, right? What happened to Arendel? Now, notice when I just used the passive voice there, I did that for the same reason that the poem does. Because if to put that in the active voice, if you want to say what this poem is really about is what the Valar do to Arendel, well, that means the emphasis of the poem is the Valar and what the Valar did. This is not a poem that bears a grudge against the Valar or the Eldar or anybody else, right? But it is talking about the doom that was laid upon Arendel, whoever laid the doom, right? Um, it's not about that. It's not about blaming, but it is about saying what Arendel suffered, what happened to him. Um, and here, I think, in this stanza, we begin to see that um, uh, we begin to see that pattern most clearly, right? Um, here where we would expect, if anywhere, Arendel to be in the spotlight. This is literally his big moment. Um, and he is out of the spotlight. Notice what also doesn't happen in this stanza at any point. His name being mentioned, right? In fact, golly, nobody's name is mentioned in this stanza, right? We got a couple... Um, we get Ilmarin and the Calicurian. We get a couple of geographical features uh, named, right? Um, we get the Elder King, which is close to a naming, right? But he's given even that we're using a circumlocution, right? We're using just his title rather than a name, right? Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, good. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Tim Dolphins is asking, the doom is not about what anyone did, but about human or Valar, what human and Valar nature are subject to. Yeah, Tim, I think that's a really good way to think about it. Because um, again, like it's if um, if you say, again, if 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 the poem uses the active voice in the other way around, right? If this poem is about what the Valar did to Arendel, then it makes it sound like, oh man, like, you know, he's been done wrong by, right? Um, uh, like it makes it sound like, like a grudge. It makes it sound, uh, like an accusation. Um, but Tim, I agree with you. It's not what happens to Arendel is not necessarily just like, this is not a piece of persecution by the Valar. Um, this is, how things must be. This is a consequence of the nature of how the world works in a sense, right? Um, uh, this is the doom that was laid on him, right? It was his doom to come to Valinor and deliver this message. And it is his doom to suffer the consequences of that coming to Valinor, right? Exactly. Inherent in nature. It's not about really anybody's agency. Um, yeah, that actually, that, 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 that seems to me like a really, really good way, um, to, 
to think about it. And yeah, I'd never really noticed the, I mean, I'd noticed the fact that the passive voice is used in this, uh, in this stanza. Listen to me, I'm using the passive voice all over the place. I can't help myself now. Um, thinking about and talking about the passive voice here. Um, I had noticed that Tolkien uses the passive voice uh, in this, or Bilbo uses the passive voice in this stanza, but I hadn't ever really thought it, thought it through this way. This is really, this is really cool. But again, it's, it's in that second quatrain where we begin to bury the lead, where we begin to suppress like the drama, the real drama of, um, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the story. Um, to hidden land forlorn he went. Now, a couple of you were talking about the word forlorn. Um, and it is kind of interesting. Forlorn is an adjective modifying which noun? It stands between two nouns. Is he forlorn? Or is the land forlorn? Is it a hidden land forlorn? Or is forlorn he went? Um... It's kind of ambiguous. Um, I, syntactically, it's ambiguous. Um, yeah, it could be something like the manner of his going. I mean, forlorn is not usually an adverb, um, but it does seem to have a more adverbial sense if you connect it to the latter part of the line, right? Um, but if you connect it to hidden land forlorn, that's a perfectly natural thing to say as an adjective. Uh, you know, the land is both hidden and forlorn. So to, to use that, it, it's, 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 it's an, an unorthodox word order, but that's certainly very common in poetry in general and in this poem in particular. Um, so it's it's like what he did with distressed Simon, but it's a different thing, right? Instead of separating the 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 adjective and its antecedent, here um, he is uh, he's creating this sort of ambiguity. It could well be Flamifer that it's both essentially, and that we're supposed to kind of look both ways from forlorn there, right? There's a lot of for the land is forlorn and he is forlorn. Both of those things seem to. Um, um, seemed to seem to be true right um yeah yeah um yeah yeah um but of course here's the really cool thing the adjective applies equally in either direction but depending on where you apply it it means something different if the land is forlorn then that means it's empty. There's nobody there, which of course, if pretending we've read the Silmarillion, that would make sense, right? Sort of, um, in context, but so hidden land forlorn, it is an empty land, right? It has been apparently abandoned, right? Um, he is forlorn because he has been, he is going by himself, right? He has left everyone and everything else behind. He is forlorn uh, because, so the land is empty. He is alone, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Simon, I agree. It, it is, it's interesting either way. Um, he says, on the one hand, he's in the blessed realm, so the land really shouldn't be forlorn. At least you wouldn't think so. I agree. And on the other, this is supposed to be his moment of triumph. So why would he be forlorn? Well, he's forlorn because he's less, left everything behind, right? Um, but if forlorn is a description of his um, emotional state, like he's feeling forlorn, uh, you know, meaning he's feeling sort of like sad and lonely, Right. Um, it is certainly an anticlimactic way to feel right when you finally achieve your uh, uh, your quest here. Um, yeah, good. Both Fourth Dauntless and Mad Violinist are wondering if the uh, if the sage is old uh, might have uh, that among the marvels that they were telling him might have been the consequences of his actions. Yeah. Uh, if you step off this boat, you're never going home, right? Um, yeah, that seems very likely. 
That seems very likely. He came unto the timeless halls, where shining fall the countless years, and endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer. Um, what happens in this stanza? I'm sorry, that, not that stanza, this stanza, that quatrain. He came unto the timeless halls, where shining fall the countless years, and endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer. He came. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he came. And where did he come exactly? Here I am laying stress on the preposition. He came as the subject and verb. That's what happens. And everything else describes where he came. The timeless halls. You know, the ones where shining fall the countless years. Oh, you know, the ones where endless reigns the elder king. You know, in Ilmarin, on Mountain Sheer. Those ones. Those timeless halls. Right? So everything else in the quatrain is telling us more about the timeless halls. Unto is the preposition. Yeah. Unto. He doesn't come into the timeless halls. He's not entering the halls. This stanza brings him before the doors. And although Manway is indirectly named by being called the Elder King, we don't meet him, right? Um, he's still, sir, not appearing in this poem so far. Still, we have Arendel is still forlorn at the end of this stanza, right? We only have him, as far as we know anyway, um, he came unto the timeless halls. He's on the threshold, right? He's standing in front of the timeless halls, where shining fall the countless years and endless reigns the elder king in Ilmarin on mountain sheer. Um, the Ilmarin on mountain sheer recalls us back to the setting, right? This is what he saw before. We had Ilmarin, right? Where pale as glass beneath the hill of Ilmarin, a glimmer in a valley sheer, the lamplit towers of Tyrion are mirrored in the shadow mirror. Right? That was the end of the description of, you know, the scene that he sees, the, the sounds that he hears um, when he gets to his destination here. Right? Um, so, in Ilmarin on Mountain Sheer, we're to, so that, that sort of tied in at the end. So he's now arrived on foot at the timeless halls at the, you know, this striking thing that he saw, uh, from, uh, from the sea, right. When he sailed in notice, um, that we get three indicators of time, right? The primary description that is given to this place that he has arrived at all relate to time. And they all emphasize the same thing. Timeless, countless, endless. Right? Timeless, countless, endless. Everything in the description of this, almost everything in the description of this place that he has arrived at, um, comes back to time and to immortality. Right? Um, he doesn't just come into the halls. He comes into the timeless halls. So within these halls, there is no time, right? Um, those halls, the first description of them is where shining fall the countless years. The years fall in the hall, around the hall. Um, and the years are shining. The hall isn't shining. It's the years that are shining, where shining fall the countless years, right? Um, yeah, I don't know the sense, Simon, in which the years are shining exactly. Um, but yes, Simon, I agree with you. It is triply outside the realm of mortal folk. Um, you are not in mortal lands anymore is emphasized boom, boom, boom in this quatrain, right? Um, yes. Um, uh, yeah, for Thomas wants uh, to know if timeless... Could timeless mean ageless? Probably. I mean, we know for a fact that they are not literally timeless, right? It's not that time does not pass there. 
Time passes even for the Valar because we're told that even the Valar may grow weary, right? Um, and there is even a sense in which the Valar age. So we know it's not actually outside of time, right? Um, it certainly is ageless, I think. But yes, Rinrus, the years pouring past like a waterfall. Um, hang on a second. Give me a second. Let me reorient myself to a different poem. Uh, okay, I've got this one. I've got the rhythm of this one so firmly in my head, I can't quote the other one. Um, the flowing years, Tarlonio, is exactly the line that I was thinking of. The end of the first stanza of the Where Now the Horse and the Rider poem. Um, uh, the flowing years... Uh, that are that flow like a river out towards the sea in the last line again i i can't quote it because i, I need to get the rhythm of that poem in my head to be able to quote it and uh and i can't because i've got this poem in my head and that's okay i want to keep this poem in my head um but if someone if somebody could quote that for me i'd be grateful um uh anyway yeah so it's it's interesting to me the contrast there right um or behold the flowing years uh from the sea returning yeah 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 that's the one it's flowing, I'm pretty sure. That stanza is all about the uh, that stanza of that poem is all about the the present participles. Flowing, uh, shining, et cetera, et cetera. Um Yeah. Yeah. Um Hey look, that's like a paper topic all by itself, right? Um uh compare and contrast the shining fall of the countless years here. Um, the flowing years from the sea returning. Uh, uh, Mad Violinist is saying there's also something like it in Gladriel's po the I Sang of Leaves poem. Yes, there is. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and no, I, I got I the rhythm of that one is closer, so it'd be easier to get in my head. But I don't want to. I don't want to go there. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so it is like what is primarily so what is emphasized here and simon this comes back to what you were saying before the emphasis of this quatrain is that arendel has emphatically left the mortal lands he is in a place which is not natural to him right a place that the the the, the countless years fall shining in around about right um the timeless halls, the ageless. So he is stepping outside of mortal time. Um, this is emphatically a transgression. Tim, to think of the way that you were talking about this, this is not a place meant for him. This does not fit his nature, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, even though uh, that last line of the quatrain ties it back to what he saw from a distance before, right? And then the last quatrain. And words unheard were spoken then of folk of men and elven kin. Beyond the world were visions showed forbid to those that dwell therein. Now, in the midst of all of these passive verbs in this quatrain, who is doing what? It's hard, even knowing what the story is supposed to be, it is, um, it is hard to parse this, right? Um, first, as uh, one of you who was talking about this before mentioned this a long time ago, ages ago, when, we, when, I, when I first read that through about um, Simon, I think maybe it was you, um, about... Um, uh, who about the, the words unheard, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Words unheard. That is a very striking phrase and words unheard were spoken then. What do you do with that line? And words unheard were spoken then. I mean, we've got some basic problems, right? We start with who is speaking words to whom we have no idea, right? Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a passive verb with the subject completely suppressed and the object completely suppressed, right? Um, 
And so we have no, but that's only the beginning of our problems, right? Uh, in what sense are words unheard spoken? If they're spoken, you could hear them, right? Does it mean words that had never been heard before? Um, probably something like that is meant, but this, this line, I think, is supposed to sound like a paradox. Um, I mean, I, I think it, it we, we can parse it into something that makes sense. Um, words unheard were spoken then, I think, does mean words that had never been heard before were now uttered for the first time, right? That's, that's how I would paraphrase that line. But it's important that it's not stated like that. It's stated in the form of a paradox. And I think that that's a very important thing, right? Um, yes, an invocation of mystery. Exactly. Um, uh, yes, good. Uh, un unheard by any who were not there, right? So uh, it could also be a fancy way of saying, and we don't know what was said exactly, right? But again, it says way more than that as well. Uh, again, it does say that, I think, but it manages to suggest something far more profound um, uh, than that. Um, a couple of people are asking about telepathy. I don't think so. Be spoken seems to be fairly clear. I mean, it could mean spoken from mind to mind. It's not impossible, but I don't, I don't think that it is. It sounds paradoxical because it's a circumlocution to suggest telepathy. That would be one possibility, but I tend not to think so. I tend to think, uh, that the paradox is designed to, um, uh, emphasize the mystery of this moment. Um, and also again, like your English teacher always tried to prevent happening in your papers, you don't want to make it sound like things just happen all by themselves, right? If something's happening, somebody did a thing, right? So be honest about who's doing the, be on it, be clear. Um, because as soon as you start using the passive voice, it's easy if you're not careful about what you're doing to let your prose get really muddy, Right. Where it becomes unclear who's doing what to whom. I have no idea. Right. How is this thing happening? It's just kind of occurring right vaguely. Um, but I think that those those uh, effects are very much intended here. And again, thinking back to this central theme of doom uh, that, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of sensing behind this whole stanza. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Good. Katrina is urging us to follow through. Let's follow through the syntax. Words unheard were spoken then of folk of men and elven kin beyond the world where visions showed forbid to those that dwelt therein. So we do have two subjects and verbs, right? Words were spoken is the first pair. And visions were showed, right, is the second pair. Words are spoken, visions are shown. That's what's happening here. That's what's going on here. We're never told exactly who is speaking words to whom. We don't know who exactly is showing visions to whom, of what. Um, we do know, that's the one thing we do know about the words. We do we are told of what they are. Words unheard were spoken then of folk of men and elven kin. So the unspoken, un the spoken unheard words spoken by somebody to somebody else are about the folk of men and elven kin. As far as the visions that are shown by somebody to somebody else. Um, the only thing we're told, there are only two things we're told about the visions. One is that it happened beyond the, the visions are beyond the world. And the second is that it's forbid to those that dwell therein. And yes, therein means the world. Beyond the world where visions showed forbid to those that dwell therein in the world. So 
Um, if you live in the world, you're forbidden to see these visions because they're visions, or, or I just say and, and they are visions beyond the world. But wait, visions beyond the, beyond the world were visions showed. Does that mean that's where they were showed? Like visions were showed beyond the world? Does that, is that sentence the same thing like the movie was shown at the cinema eight? Right. I mean, is that, is that, uh, are those sentences parallel? Is that the location of the visions or is it what the visions are about? Are we being shown visions of beyond the world? Because remember, we were already told in the previous stanza, remember uh, where ends the world, right? He began until he heard on strands of pearl where ends the world, the music long. So when the way where the waves are cresting, this beach is the end of the world. And he's gone beyond the end of the world, right? When he's gone through the Calakirian and uh, presumably, again, now you've come to the time, timeless halls, right? You are, this is, um, this is beyond the edge of the world. Right. Um, good. Mad violinist earlier, and I missed it before. And Simon now is pointing out two more triple rhymes. Words unheard were spoken then of folk of men and elven king. Well, that one's not a triple rhyme. It's an extra rhyme. Right. We get an internal rhyme at the beginning, which is not connected to the other ones. Right. Words unheard were spoken then of folk of men and elven kin. Uh, and then Simon was pointing out, um, then men and kin um, were spoken then of folk of men and elven kin. Um, now, spoken then and folk of men are supposed to rhyme, right? That's the normal internal line. Elven kin isn't exactly parallel with folk of men. Um, spoken then, folk of men, elven kin... But it's as close as some of the other rhymes that we've had internally. Again, sometimes those rhymes are fairly, uh, are fairly gentle. And I know Flamifer, it does connect down to dwell therein. But that's what we've been seeing in this stanza is variations from that. So the idea that Elvenkin, uh, as a phrase, right, not only rhymes in the way, in the pattern, in the normal pattern, right, um, dwell therein, but also, uh, looks back to, or, listens back to, uh, echoes back, I suppose is better, uh, to spoken then and folk of men. Um, Simon, I mean, one of the things that, um, uh, that, uh, convinces me there is the case, right? Um, spoken folk kin, um, and even Elvin, um, the V and the, and the fact that we have a V there and an F, uh, in with folk, Right. I mean, there's there's uh, several sounds as well as the general pattern uh, and the assonance, uh, which does to me connect those uh, connect those lines. Um, so we're finding throughout this stanza, um, we're finding throughout this stanza that um, uh, we're getting an increased richness of the rhyme patterns. Right. Um, we're getting this sort of these extra kind of grace notes, right. Um, thrown in there, sages old, marvels told, harps of gold, um, words unheard, um, spoken then for folk of men and elven kin. Um, yeah, that's really cool. It's really interesting. Uh, let's see if we, well, we haven't seen this before. I don't think we've, we've, we haven't noticed it if it's happened earlier in the poem. Um, I'll be interested to see if it continues on. Um, we don't know. Okay, so here, I'm trying to pause for a second. Here's the reason I was just pausing. I was about to say, often when I pause like that, it's because I'm about to say something and right before the words escape my mouth, my brain says, now, hang on a second. You might want to think about that because I think what you're about to say is wrong. Or I just think of a counterexample to what I'm about to say. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the thing that I was about to say was we know in the end that the words unheard are spoken by a Arendel to the elder King because of the prepositional phrase of folk of men and elven kin. But then I was like, wait a second. 
Do we know that? I mean, we know that if we've read the Silmarillion, but do we know that if we haven't read the Silmarillion? Do we know that from the context of this poem? I don't think so. We know that there was um, a purpose, right? But the only thing we were told about that was never sight he saw of shining shore nor light he sought. We know he's seeking the light and the shining shore. And when he arrives at the shining shore, it's pretty clear that that's the shore that he, you know, when we see the shore in question, it becomes pretty clear that that is indeed the shore that he was aiming for the whole time. Right. So we can put together that he definitely was looking for to arrive in Valinor, but do we know what he wanted there? We get the word errand used a couple times, errandless, right? When he's going home because he's given up his errand. And then we've got him tarrying from Aaron Tree. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't think we know. I don't think we know what he's come for. Which, again, you'd think would be a tolerably important element to include in the poem. Right. But it's kind of not shocking, actually, in the context of what we've been seeing in this stanza. This is not about this stanza is not about um, which should be about. But it's not about a accomplishes his wonderful, incredible, epic quest. It's not about that. It suppresses a activity and it doesn't even explain what the quest was. Why is he going through the Calicarian to the hidden land or to the hidden land forlorn? Um, why is he going to the timeless halls? I don't think we have any idea internally. This poem is not interested in that. It's just not. Um, so we don't really know. It is possible, as a couple of you are saying, um, it could be either way. It is possible, of course, that the timeless king, or the time, the elder king, sorry, in his timeless halls, could be speaking words unheard of folk of men and elven kin, right? He could be, uh, I mean, we already had the sages telling him marvels, right? So he could be like, all right, let me explain to you how it really works about, you know, the folk of men and elven kin, right? Um, I'm going to tell you stuff about this that nobody in the world uh, has ever heard before, right? No, no one from the mortal lands anyway has ever heard this before. It could happen, Right. Again, knowing the story from the Silmarillion, it seems likely that this is him speaking to the Valar. But even then, it's not 100% certain, right? Um, and this, the last stanza, Beyond the world where visions showed forbid to those that dwell therein, um, we can't tell for sure at all, even in vague terms, what not only do we know, not know who's showing visions to whom, but we don't know what anything about what the visions were about because beyond the world might simply be, um, you know, talking about the fact that these visions were happening beyond the world. So, um, yeah, this poem is about what happens to Arendel. This is a, this is a, this is about his quest, but it's not about his quest, right? Um, now you're right, Mornowin, that there is certainly a sense in which everybody, certainly everybody in this audience, uh, knows about Arendel and the quest. So, you know, no one needs to tell the story itself. Um, yes. I mean, that's certainly justification for Bilbo taking this particular angle on the poem, right? Because he doesn't have to tell the story. The story is known. Um, so instead, he can kind of take that as read and focus on another element. Whereas if he were just telling, an audience that knew nothing about Arendel or what he did, it would be much harder for him to do that. Except, of course, Mornowin, Tolkien is doing exactly that with 100% of the audience of the book, right? Who none of them know what Arendel did. Um, we don't know anything about the quest or why he was doing it or where he went or what he accomplished, right? Um, so it's kind of ironic, Mornowin. Everybody in the room knows the story. Everyone but except the reader knows the story, right? Which is a really interesting exception uh, to that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it is interesting that the um, 
the revelation of things, right? The the revelation of mysteries, the giving of, uh, you know, of knowledge and wisdom sort of brackets the stanza as well, right? We start off with the teaching of melodies and the telling of marvels, and we end with the speaking of uns of unheard words and and the showing of uh, forbidden visions. <clears throat> um, yeah. Now, Fort Thoughtless says the last two lines are a big fat warning to the reader that this story doesn't have a happy ending. Quite likely. Um, uh, <clears throat> forbid to those that dwell therein. Yeah, we're, it is a bit of a teaser of what the ending is going to be, right? Um, yeah, everybody who lives in the mortal world, n none of them can see these visions. But we're going to show them to Arendel, right? Can you, can you tell what comes next? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let's do another stanza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so only going to get through two more stanzas today. Awesome. This is fantastic. Four weeks to do. We're going to spend an entire month just on this poem. Like you do. A ship then new they built for him of mithril and of elven glass with shining prow. No shaven oar nor sail she bore on silver mast. The Silmaril as lantern light and banner bright with living flame to gleam thereon by Elbereth herself was set, who thither came and wings immortal made for him and laid on him undying doom to sail the shoreless skies and come behind the sun and light of moon. Okay. Um. Yeah, mad violinists were breaking quatrains again. Right. And and lines. Right. We do that right from the beginning. A ship then knew they built for him of mithril and of elven glass with shining prow. No shaven oar nor sail she bore on silver mast. So that quatrain, we do end up with a colon there breaking at the end of the quatrain. But we have an interruption halfway through line three. And notice before that, the first two and a half lines of the quatrain are about they're the positive things, right? Here are the things that the ship is, the ship does contain, and the last line and a half is about the negative things, what the ship does not contain, right? There are some things that you might not expect, and there are some things that you do expect that you don't find. Right, A ship then knew they built for him of mithril and of elven glass with shining prow. No, el sh no shaven oar nor sail she bore on silver mast. Hey, Chris. Yeah. I think this might be the first use of the word mithril. Like ever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the concept of Mithril isn't going to really be fleshed out. I wouldn't be surprised. <sighs> so in The Treason of Isengard, that's where he does the, like, all the versions of this poem. But because Christopher Tolkien already gives us, like, four versions of the poem in Treason of Isengard, he, um, he doesn't, um, <laughs> there's stuff he doesn't give us, basically. Uh, he doesn't give us, like, all of the like changes and modifications. If I had to guess, Chris, I would say that it is likely that um, the concept of Mithril emerges at the time when they have the conversation about the coat, right? In Moria, right? After Frodo gets stabbed or non stabbed, right? By the orc. Uh, and that, the, like that, you know, Gimli's exclamations about Mithril and explaining how it was found only in Moria. Um, that feels to me like, like that has all of the hallmarks of Tolkien subcreating there, right? Um, it's happening in dialogue as so often happens, right? Somebody comments on something and then starts explaining something and it kind of all emerges, right? Um, uh, the idea that the mail that Bilbo had and gives to Frodo is, is, uh, is really special. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that it was there. Um, that it was there that that the concept of mithril, um, because it's clearly good armor. It's dwarf armor in any case, right? Um, but I I suspect that the concept of mithril emerges at the Moria conversation, 
Um, and that he then adds that to the poem in a revival. But it's certainly, as a reader, the first time we encounter it, um, if you don't count the revised Hobbit. Um, but in The Lord of the Rings, I'm pretty sure it's the first time that we encounter it. But I doubt that he invented it here, because that doesn't um, that doesn't strike me as... It's possible, but that seems to me that that would be unusual, I think, in Tolkien's process. Whereas that conversation about Mithril, um, especially how kind of random it sounds, right? I mean, like they just like start having this conversation about uh, about Mithril uh, and Gimli starts waxing poetic about it and everything kind of like, you know, Faramir won't shut up about Gondor and, um, you know, the hobbits get sidetracked on the way to, uh, on the way to Buckland, uh, talking about hobbit whole architecture, right? That's the way that these sort of sub creative moments seem to kind of bubble up, uh, in Tolkien's prose. So I suspect, um, though I don't think you, we can prove it. Maybe we can, but I, uh, maybe it's Christopher points it out more specifically than I'm recalling. Um, uh, the first time that Tolkien does the Ringo South stuff. Um, but I think, yeah, it's the first use of the word Mithril in the text for Thala, certainly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyhow, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I'm not questioning whether or not Aule could, uh, could produce some. Uh, it, it's just that what we're talking about here is when Tolkien came up with the concept of Mithril. Um, and I, I do suspect that it came after the, the initial composition of the poem. That's all. Um, yeah. Oh, Flammif, a really great question. Sorry, I'm doing really bad paying attention to my AFK tonight. Um, I, Flammifer says that Bilbo is pretty definite that they built the new ship. Um, uh, yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> he is. I'm not quite sure what to do with that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, the emphasis, where it fits in the poem, I, 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 a different question, which I'm less interested in discussing right now, is how that concept in this poem fits with the other versions of this story that we get, like in the Silmarillion, for instance, or if you go back to the Book of Lost Tales stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, I, um, uh, um, I, I mean, I, I think we could have a conversation about that, but I'm a little bit less interested in focusing on that. Instead, I want to focus on, um, uh, the role in this poem as Bilbo is presenting it. And there it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense, right? Um, notice what they did for A. Arendel. We go back to what they did then at the, the mysterious then, when apparently he decides to persevere and go on into Valinor, they give him new clothes. Right now, I mean, you know, that's probably nice. I'm sure, you know, the clothes that he's been wearing on board ship are, you know, the worst for wear at this point, right? So he's going off into the, um, the going off into the, uh, he's going off into Valinor and, and, uh, uh, um, this is an upgrade, right? They're not going to let him go off all raggedy, right? Um, but um, but I think there's sort of more than that, right? He, um, they give him new clothes. Now they're giving him a new ship. In other words, like nothing that he brought with him. Well, there's only one thing that he brought with him that we're told he brings on, right? That he's allowed to keep. And that's the Silmaril. Right? Um, what about his wife, you ask? What about Elwing? To which I would respond, what about Elwing? What, 
Wait, she's not mentioned, right? Um, we don't know what's going on with Elwing. It, 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 it's uh, not the subject of this poem, right? Um, so the new boat uh, does seem to be part of the pattern. Yeah, Tim, I was thinking of the wedding garment uh, from the Gospels. Um, it does seem something that there, there's something slightly reminiscent there, right? Um, but anyway, the question of what happened to Elwing, it's not that that's not an interesting or important question, but it is clearly a question in which this poem has no interest, right? At least it's not giving any kind of response to that question. Um, yeah, Rinroos, it is possible that, like, you can get away with making poems about dad, but you don't make yo mama poems <laughs> in Elrond's house. Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, would that be a, a, a one step uh, of cheekiness too far? <laughs> it is, yeah, I don't know what the motivations here would be, but certainly, again, it's not a question that the poem answers, so we can't answer it. But all we can say is we can conclude that it seems uninterested in answering that question, right? Um, yeah, so... Um, he's given a new boat. The old boat is, we don't know what happens to the old boat, but he just can't take it with him. He can't take his clothes with him. He can't take his boat with him. So here he is himself, new clothes, new stuff, new harps, new, uh, uh, new, um, um, uh, new, uh, uh, what you call it? Um, right. New melodies, uh, new marvels, right. New visions, words unheard, which may or may not have been spoken to him. And off he goes, uh, we don't know yet, where yet. The Silmaroa's lantern light and banner bright with living flame to gleam thereon by Elbereth herself was set. Who thither came and wings immortal made for him and laid on him undying doom to sail the shoreless skies and come beyond the, the sun and light of moon. Um... Yeah, new wings. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, uh, it is, Amy, almost like a kind of rebirth. Yes, I agree with that. Um, yes. And, um, yeah. Okay. You know, a couple things I'm wanting to parse here, because uh, this gets kind of complex. Especially, again, the rhythm. You hear how irregular the rhythm is in this? Um the Silmarilla's lantern light and banner bright with living flame. What should we be remembering? The description of the boat. Boat number one. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan and light upon her banners laid. So there was light laid on the banner before, which we couldn't decide for sure if that meant there is like, light is the symbol of, like his symbol um, that's on the banner, like sewn onto the banner, or whether that just means that it's well lit, like there is light on it, right? Um, uh, like it's a well illuminated banner, right? Uh, and we also see, of course, her the silver lanterns uh, that the ship uh had before, right? Um, now, the Silmaril as lantern light and banner bright with living flame. Now the Silmaril literally is the banner, right? In place of the banner, he has the Silmaril. The Silmaril is the lantern. The Silmaril is the banner. Um, and it is bright with living flame. It's not, there's not just light laid on the banner anymore. Right. Whatever exactly that means. Now it is a banner bright with living flame. To gleam thereon by Elbereth herself was set. Who thither came and wings immortal made for him and laid on him undying doom to sail the shoreless skies and come behind the sun in light of moon. Okay. Syntax. 
Um, starting after the colon, what's the first subject in verb? What's the what's the subject in verb after the colon? Nor sail she bore on silver mast. Colon. Yeah. Uh, yes. Elbereth uh, uh, set is the verb. Um. Elbereth is the subject, but not grammatically, because it's passive again. Was set by Elbereth. And that's how, of course, you indicate the doer of the action using the passive voice, right? The Silmaril was set by Elbereth. Elbereth set the Silmaril would be active voice. The Silmaril was set by Elbereth is, um, uh, is the, um, uh, is the passive voice version. So we get the, so we get the passive voice again. But instead of the totally ambiguous passive voice, right, where we have no idea who is doing the action or who is receiving the action, here we have, very unusually so far, both things stated explicitly. We know the action, which is happening passively, uh, which is being spoken of passively anyway, but we know the object of the action and the doer of the action. They're just swapped. The Silmaril as lantern light and banner bright with living flame to glean thereon by Elbereth herself was set. Now, this is one of the functions. This is one of the reasons why I disagree with your English teacher who always told you never, ever, ever to use the passive voice, because sometimes you really need to use the passive voice. It's important to use the passive voice. And those times would be times like this, when the object of the action is the really important thing, right? So say you are writing a, a history paper about a certain president of the United States, and you might want to say Abraham Lincoln was shot, right? Because he's not the doer of the action. So if you put that in the passive or in the active voice, you would have to say, you know, Booth shot Lincoln. But if you put it in the active voice, it lays the emphasis on the doer, on the subject, right? Booth is now the subject of that, uh, of that sentence. But you don't want him to be the subject of the sentence. You don't want the focus to be on him. You want the sentence to be primarily about Lincoln, right? So you put it in the passive voice so that you get Abraham Lincoln was shot, right? Passive voice is a really good thing. And that's one of the things that you most... Uh, most often and most importantly use the passive voice for when you want the um, the object to shine out, as it were. And in this case, the Silmaril is the object of the action. It is being set upon the ship, right? Um, so, okay. So, it, and it comes first, as it's supposed to, right, in the passive voice. The Silmaril by Elbereth, was set. Great. It does show us how big a deal the Silmaril is. Um, yeah, so, Simon, it's kind of interesting, right? Um, Elbereth, so, uh, Simon says, the speaker wasn't important before. Um, that is, who was speaking the, the, the words unheard, right? Um, but Elbereth is important here. She's named. Yes, but she's still the victim of a passive voice sentence, right? Again, when you use the passive voice, you de-emphasize the doer of the action. So she's present, which is makes a change, right, compared to the previous stanza. But she's de-emphasized, right? Um, but I would say this. She is clearly not unimportant. We have two reasons to think that the sentence is giving a very strong secondary significance to, a to not Aerindel, uh, to Elbereth, right? First, the reversal of the word order. The normal word order for passive voice is, uh, well, thinking not of the grammar, but of the, of the, of the action, right? Object of the action, which is the subject of the sentence in the passive voice, the verb, and then the prepositional phrase, right? So, the Silmaril was set by Elbereth would be the normal way in which you would express that. It reverses the order to put Elbereth before the verb, 
right? The verb is pushed way back to the end of the entire thing, right? The Silmarilla's lantern light and banner bright with living flame to gleam thereon by Elbereth herself was set. We finally get to the verb. Right? Because the verb is not what's important. The Silmaril is what's most important, and who said it there is the second most important thing. Right? Those are the two things. The other thing that emphasizes the importance of Elbereth in that sentence is the reflexive pronoun, herself, by Elbereth herself. And of course, the fact that Elbereth herself is an internal rhyme, right? Um, uh, you know, so that the, those, that whole pair of lines pivots on Elbereth herself definitely uh, helps, right, with the emphasis of Elbereth there as well. Um, yeah, uh, Rinru says, everyone but Eärendil is de-emphasized in this poem. Yeah, I, yeah well, but again, Eärendil himself is de-emphasized in this poem as well, right? Um, at least in the last stanza he was. Um, and he's not appeared at all. He, again, he's a pronoun in the first line for him. Uh, uh, and then we get for him again. Um, and then on him. So he's a pronoun, which is three times the object of preposition uh, in, in, these, in this stanza, right? Um, so that's not super prominent. Uh, but here's another word that really interests me in this phrase, thereon. Thereon what? To gleam thereon. Where is it being set, the summer? What is that what does that send what does that word thereon refer back to? The mast? Maybe. I mean the mast is comparatively recent. The mast is only three lines before, right? But remember, the mast is being brought up in the negative part. No shaven or nor sail she bore on silver mast. Um so it is possible. So it didn't bear a sail on the silver mast. Instead, the Silmaril was set thereon, on the mast. That's possible. That's possible. Um, it's also possible that it's the ship. A ship then knew they built for him. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the stanza. Um, it could be the prow. It could be the mast. It could be the prow. I'm thinking like, what are the candidates? Could be the mast. It could be the prow. It could be the ship. Um, in any case, it is super removed. I mean, it is we it is syntactically very weird to say thereon when like lines have come between that and its antecedent, right? It could be the mast, but it could be the prow. Um, I never answered the question somebody was asking um, about uh, elven glass. What is elven glass? Um, I assume that elven glass is similar to imperishable crystal. I assume that elven glass is something like what Frodo's file is made from. Something vaguely like what the Silmarils themselves are made of, though that's fan or secret recipe. Um, uh, but, you know, I assume it's something like that. Um, but we don't really know. We're not really told. But that seems to be what the Shining Prow is of. Um, the Prow does shine, right? We're given Shining to describe Prow, and it's of elven glass. So... It would make sense to set the Silmaril on the shining prow, as it wouldn't be real shining, uh, as lantern light and banner bright. So, but but banner bright suggests maybe it is the mast, right? Because that's where you would put the banner on top of the mast. 
probably it's the mast. Um, one of the points that I'm trying to make here is this sentence is seriously convoluted, right? I don't think he's trying to do something really clever like he was with the word distressed before. Um, but, um, I am interested in the, uh, complexity, um, of the syntax of this sentence. And then we have our second interruption in the middle of the line. And yes, Simon, this whole stanza is one sentence. Absolutely. A ship then knew they built for him of mithril and of elven glass with shining prow. Semicolon. So that's one independent clause, right? Now the second independent clause. No shaven oar nor sail she bore on silver mast. Second independent clause. Colon. Third independent clause. The Silmaril is lantern light and bannern bright with living flame to glean thereon by Elbereth her, her, herself was set. Who thither came and wings immortal made for him and laid on him undying doom to sail the shoreless skies and come behind the sun in light of moon. That whole thing, four and a half lines, is a subordinate clause. Uh, who's Elbereth? Or, like, what's Elbereth up to? I mean, apart from setting Silmarils herself, right? Who thither came? Who? Elbereth. Who thither came? So, she came, right? The who is the pronoun which is uh, referring back to Elbereth, and that's the subject of the action, right? Came is the first subject of the action. Who thither came? And... Wings immortal made for him. So she came, she made, and she laid. Right? Laid on him undying doom to sail the shoreless, shoreless skies and come behind the sun and light of moon. Which doom? The doom to sail the shoreless skies and come behind the sun and light of moon. So we have a compound infinitive phrase in the last two lines, which modify undying doom. Right? which is laid upon him by Elbereth, who has also made immortal wings for him and who also came thither. Right? Okay. Well, that's simple enough. Um, now, Mad Violinist, you're absolutely right. We do have context for Elbereth. Um, as readers of the book, we have heard her as the subject of hymns, and just in case we weren't paying attention to the poetry, even if we skip the poems, we know this, right? Because Frodo says it, right? They spoke the name of Elbereth, right? And then, of course, we do have uh, a, a weapon of wraith destruction, right? When Frodo drops the E-bomb. So we have had Elbereth a couple times, and importantly, not just... And then, of course, Frodo swears by her, uh, right? Or invokes her uh, at the fort. So we've had Elbereth a bunch of times. Um, yes. Yes, Bruce, I think you're right. She's literally the only Vala who's been named. Ever. As far as we know. Right? I don't think there have been any other Vala named in the entire book. To this point. Apart from Elberth. Seems right. We've got the elder king, right? But again, that's a that's a circumlocution. That's not um, that's not a name like Elbereth. Okay. Um, Elbereth starts doing things, and sorry, who was pointing this out too? We got she's yes. Uh, Simon says, although it is in a subordinate clause, she does at least get the active voice there, right? And and how? Right. Not only does Elbereth do things in the active voice, she does multiple things. She does three things. Right. Uh, it sounds like Caesar. Right. Uh, she came. She made. She laid on him undying doom. Right. That's that's how it works. <laughs> right. Um, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
She comes. Flamifer, we will get another Vala named eventually. Orame will be named when um, uh, Theoden is going to gallop off into uh, onto the Pelennor field. Um, he might be the only other one, though. Not in the appendices. Yeah, wholly unexplained, Simon. Absolutely, but uh, but he's there. He's there. Um, yeah, and certainly, Veronica, we have been instructed of one of the main contexts, I mean, that we got through through the song, right, through the hymn uh, to Elbereth that we first heard, is about the elves' special relationship with her. Um, absolutely. Um, that's what sets her apart, as you say. Um, where is Thither? Where is she going? Where they built the ship, I guess. To the ship. Yeah, presumably. Where's that? I mean, is the magic shipyard? That is, a magic shipyard is not a shipyard which is magical. It's a ship, it's a yard in which you build magic ships, right? So, is the magic shipyard near the port? Is it somewhere else? Heck, these are flying ships. Is it even on the ocean? Is it inland? Is it on the mountaintop? Maybe it is. Maybe it's on Ilmarin. We we don't know where thither is. Yeah, I mean, thither is to the ship. But again, where's where is where is that? Um it's just interesting to me who thither came. Um you know, to we know not where. Uh where I guess I mean A. Arendel seems to be there, though again he's only mentioned in pronoun form and as the object of prepositions in this in this stanza. Once again, the, these two stanzas, um A. Arendel is uh very much in the background. And of course, remember back here? In panoply of ancient kings, enchanted rings, he armored him, his shining horde. Uh, uh, him. Look at all the pronouns here. From him, his bow was made, his arrows shorn of silver was his haberjohn, his scabbard of chalcedony, his sword of shield was valiant, of adamant, his helmet tall. Almost every single line has at least one him or his, right? Um, so, um... And although some of these things are being done indirectly, a lot of this is uh, is him doing stuff, right? So this is this is this first the first arming that we get before he sets off, right? Uh, and look how much he is the center of this. And you might say, well, of course he's the center. It's describing him. Right? It's describing what he's wearing, right? Well, yeah, I know. But this, of course, in stanza seven is describing his ship and things that are being done to him, right? And indeed, more important things. This is the second arming, right? The second transformation now. Uh, this is his sort of apotheosis, right? Um, so that's it would seem would be at least as much about him. Maybe it has at least as much to do with him as like his armor at the beginning. Um, but he is, uh, comparatively unimportant in this place. And it's what Elbereth does in the end, setting the Silmaril though. Of course the Silmaril is given first priority there and in that independent cause. But then we get thither came wings, immortal maid laid on him undying doom. Um, now we get to the undying doom and notice what undying echoes or recalls, right? Remember all that time imagery? Timeless, countless, endless, right? And then we get undying, right? Um, which seems to be in the same kind of category of thing um, as timeless, endless, countless. Um, but it's not him who's undying. I mean, uh, and we do get immortal, yes. Immortal in the previous line, right? Um, now, is he being made immortal? 
I mean, presumably, if his doom is undying, but we don't know. Notice, gosh, we've skipped that bit, too. So Arendel has chosen immortality, has chosen to be counted among the firstborn? Yeah, this poem's not interested in that either. This poem's not interested in what happens to Elwing. This poem's not interested in the actual mission that he accomplishes in Valinor. This poem is not interested in his choice, right, to be counted among the Eld- He Like, he's being promoted to immortality, right? But it doesn't come up. It doesn't come up. Um, uh, what does come up is that his doom is undying. His wings are immortal. But you notice how it's like how we... It's not until the third verb, Elbereth's third verb in the subordinate clause, right, that we get to the doom, right? Immortal wings. Okay. I guess that's good. Right. I mean, if you're going to have wings, it might as well be immortal wings. Because, I mean, um, uh, <laughs> come to think of it, we have a pretty good example of mortal wings in mythology, don't we? Who in mythology flew up with mortal wings? I can think of a pretty good example. Can you think? Yes, Icarus. Exactly. Uh, Icarus and Balrox. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, he is emphatically, he's not, he's not going to go the way of Icarus, right? He's going to fly behind the sun in light of moon, but, um, he has immortal wings. His, um, his wings, um, uh, uh, he's not going to fall. So Veronica, at first, that sounds like a really good thing, right? Uh, it sounds like a really good thing. He, um, uh, uh, Immortal wings. I, I mean, if I'm if I'm in a ship and my ship is being given wings, I'm I'm glad to know there isn't an expiration date on those wings, right? Uh, so that sounds good. Except uh, the next line kind of springs the um, I don't know. I mean, I'm tempted to say the punchline, but it's not a punchline, right? It's not a joke. Um, yeah, exactly. So I'm giving you immortal wings. That's the good news, right? Don't rejoice yet. You'll need them for the undying doom. Exactly. The reason your wings are going to be immortal is that you are going to spend the rest of time flying, right? Because your undying... So what's his undying doom? The infinitive phrase. To sail the shoreless skies and come behind the sun in light of moon. Twofold. Two, it's a compound infinitive. To sail to come, right? So he's going to sail the shoreless skies and he's going to come behind the sun in light of moon. That's his undying doom. And for that, he's going to need immortal wings. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm really tempted to go on, but it is super late and I should absolutely not do that. So, uh, so we did two stanzas again. Uh, who would have thunk it? Well, we've got another week. Next week, we can do two more stanzas. And then, oh, then we're going to be done with that and ready to just rip through the two entire other versions of this poem. But the good news is they're a little bit shorter than this version. So it's not going to take us nearly so long. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Sailing the shoreless skies as his undying doom does suggest, Simon, as you say, that he will be forever. There's there's nowhere to land. He's never going to come ac across strands again, right? He's never going to find a shore. Absolutely. Yeah. So exactly, Brick Tales, instead of doing four weeks like we will have done on the A. Randall poem, easily we're going to be able to finish Errantry and the, the middle version. Um in uh, at, at most three weeks each. Yeah, yeah. No, we won't spend more than another month on this poem at all. Um, no, I actually... Wait till you see. We're going to go so much faster. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I, I, I appreciate uh, your indulgence. This is, uh, uh, you know, I think one of the greatest poems that Tolkien ever wrote. So... Um, well worth spending a month on. 
Um, but <laughs> the poem is shoreless. <laughs> you know, certainly this class is shoreless. Uh, little did you know when you start when you started listening to this class uh, that uh, you know you would you, that it, that an undying doom was laid upon you. Uh, uh, so there you go. And, yeah, Bolongsman was just saying the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. Well, there it is. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I we could probably get to uh, Elbereth Gilthoniel by Thanksgiving. Sure, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> excellent. All right, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna. It's uh, field trip time. So I'm gonna. Um, uh, I'm gonna stop the Twitter broadcast. Thanks for those who are joining me on Twitter, and we're gonna switch over to Twitch only. Uh, so Signum, uh, sorry, twitchtv slash SignumU. Uh, feel free to join us there. Okay, there we go. And, uh, all right. Good evening. Can you hear me, Corey? Okay, and there we go. And unfortunately, Valori couldn't be with us again. She's been ill. Uh, she had, like, laryngitis last week, and this week she's still really hoarse, or again really hoarse. Um, uh, so couldn't be with us again. Uh, but, um, uh, and I think... Druid's Fire, I, I've been still having audio issues with you. I'm still not getting your audio if you're able to talk, so. I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll, uh, solo the field trip tonight, which is fine, because we're on Honor, um, which means I should be super careful, because if I recall correctly, um, my character, oh, he's level 50. I'll be okay. All right. That's fine. I had forgotten I was able to level him up. Um, okay. So um, let us head back out. We were exploring a place I really super want to go, but we should not go this week uh, because everybody's low level, and that is to Sarnur. Um, but we can go back to the way into Sarnur, at least, um, where we had come upon one of the coolest... No, not one of. The coolest dwarvish architectural find yet. Um, which is nice. So we will head back in that direction. Let's see. Druid's Fire Twitch could hear you? That's very strange. Why would Twitch hear you when I can't? That's even odder than before. Because I'm not seeing any... I was never seeing any of your levels showing up on my... No, I don't have you muted. I checked that. I even, like, muted you and unmuted you again to make sure. Well, I have no idea. Super strange, because the last time I was on Twitch before the... Or on uh, um, Discord before this, your audio was working. So, no idea... Folks on Twitch, I wasn't actually oh. saying anything. Wait, hang on a second. I think I fixed it. I hear Yay. you now. Yay! Hi, Corey. Okay, there Hello. we go. Thank you, Twitch, by the way. And just... Good. All Did right. Did have a lot of fun on Saturday? Uh, all right, good. I think I found the problem. Great. I love sol solving Not problems. Not my fault. Not your fault. Not your fault. I don't break things. I fix them. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, yes, you are very faint. Hang on a second, I can probably fix that. Uh, okay, say something again. Something again. That is less faint, right? Do it again. How about that? Okay, that's pretty good. I also boosted my volume in Discord. There you go. So am I, boosting your volume in Discord, because I just found out how to do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. There we go. So, 
I'm not going to drag you all into Sarnur and get you all killed. That's my Aww. plan. What can I do for you? That is the plan. And it's a fairly conservative plan, admittedly. But, um... Okay. Sorry, I'm late headed over because I was fiddling with my audio problems. Apologies for the delay. That's all right. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to hit. Uh, did you guys already head up in that direction? Nope, we're waiting for you. Where are you? Right behind you. Oh, there you are. Okay, I didn't see you. All right. Then let us head up to the Greater Sarnur region. Um, let's finish looking at what we looked at very brief, at very swiftly last time. And I barely had time to look around me. And soon, soon, we can actually just do the ride up to Thorin's Gate and work away. True. We're getting there. Yeah. Um, okay, so remember, I'm trying to remember what I saw last week at the entrance to Sarnur. At the other entrance to Sarnur, we saw evidence of a Dourhand gateway, which had been built over by a Longbeard, a newer Longbeard gateway, um, at the closed gate, right, that you can't get through. And then we were going, and but we noticed that the bridge, although all the things around it, all the uh, the posts by the road and all of the um, arches and things that you can see along the road between Gondaman and the bridge. Um, the, well, that was all Longbeard stuff, but the bridge itself was Dourhand, which, of course, from that we were able to conclude that the bridge we're about to pass by, the bridge down, well, that way. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm mirrored reversed. That bridge back over there. Um the one to the Shire was a dower hand bridge. Yep. So that was the an one ancient to bridge. Hole. Yeah, the one to Needle Hole, exactly. So the so the first thing we noticed was a dower hand bridge, which is what led me to believe that Sarnur, which was located across there, must have been originally a dower hand city. Um so I was expecting to see that and then we saw exactly what we were theorizing, and this makes me so happy, how we theorized from that one ruin up in the north that the Longbeards had come in and not just built new stuff um, and not just taken over, like, <clears throat> useful things like Kelador, which we just passed by, right? I mean, like, they're going to come and they're going to use the harbor, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. there's a perfectly good harbor, so they're going to upgrade it, you know, and they're going to uh, they're going to rebuild it. Um, so that makes all kinds of sense. Um, but in that northern ruin, to the north of the road up here north of Gondaman, we uh, uh, we saw that they had taken what was like a dower hand ruin, apparently, and just built stuff over it that didn't even have an obvious function, right? I mean, they were just like, we found this dire, dower hand place and we're going to like take it over and upgrade. For I don't know, as far as I could tell, for the sake of upgrading. Um, so, in Sarnor, we seem to be seeing that pattern confirmed. First, with a little bit less evidence, at the closed gate that we were looking at last time. Um, and uh, now, as we saw at the end of last time, and are going to confirm and look at more details of, um, from the main entrance to Sarnur itself. Okay, so this on the left is the entrance to down to the entrance to Gondavan, right? And then further on to the pass towards the Grey Havens, which is blocked off. Yep, that's true. Okay. All right. And so there are those Dourhand arches that we saw. Again, we're seeing all of this. And there on the right, more Dourhand architecture. 
Oh, so it looks like we're just entering into the, you know, the stronghold of the of the Longbeards, which of course we are. Um, but even though we have here, I don't know what the point of these are. These, like, why did we build these arches? What's the point of them? I mean, there's no gate, so it's not like it's any kind of you know portcullis or anything going right. on. Right. It's not. It's not a portcullis. There's not like a sluice for the river or anything. Um, not that you'd want to dam it up back here anyway, as that would be inconvenient. But, um, uh, interestingly enough, in the Stout Axe intro, uh, you wind up visiting the Dowry Hands there, and it's slightly redecorated. Huh. Wait, you, you visit the Dowry Hands here? Yep. Really? Like, when you leave Mordor, you go into, like, a little interlude, uh, and you learn a bit more about the political oh, situation before you go to Thorin. I forgot. We don't want to be over here. We don't actually cross the bridge to get to Sarnor. We cross the bridge to get to the way that you can't get into Sarnor. And then we have to go along the river this way. So there's no... Uh, right. Okay, so I'm sorry. You were saying you leave Mordor and go where? Um, you wind up at that archway, uh, hanging out with the Darahams, and have a little interlude with them. And you learn basically more or less the political situation of how things are from the dower hand perspective right. uh, leading into you know the dwarf intro so that by the time you're done with that intro you start in thorns hall the same as every other dwarf does right 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 okay interesting interesting okay so here is that other long beard construction that we were looking at. Again, I don't know why they built this arch either. Yeah, because it's not like it's a... It's not like an overpass. There's no pathway. Yeah, there's no pathway. The top. Exactly. Uh, it's not a bridge. It's um, not like a dam or anything. Like, we're going to no. throw down a wall to keep the water in or something. Yeah, it's not a dam. It's not a gate. Decorative architecture. A boundary marker of some kind? Perhaps. Possibly. This is our land on the other side. It's all Elvish. Yeah, because, I mean, this river... Well, no, this river winds around from Thorns Gate. Whatever. But um, still... Yeah, I mean, this certainly does seem to be the edge of their land. Based on the map. You know, and what we're shown. Okay, so we've got goblin camps. We've got... Okay, so here we have... So my theory last week was that the steps are Dowerhand because the kind of ornate detail that we see on the faces of these steps is not the same kind of patterns that we see. We don't see the kind of knot work that we see in a lot of the Dowerhand architecture. Or any of the colors. Um, so I think that the, these are Dowerhand steps and the Longbeards have put up these poles. Now, it's possible that the poles are Dowerhand, too. Can't there rule that out. There is a little work at the top, though. Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know that the Longbeards necessarily have a monopoly on that. But see, I mean, like, the knotwork that is classic Dowerhand knotwork is this stuff. Like, the bluish stuff along the mm -hmm, top mm -hmm. of here. That's the kind of thing I would have expected to be on the steps if that had been um, uh, long beard construction all the way through. Now, notice here, notice the staircase we were just on, right? I think that's probably long beard, too, because of the knotwork and... Uh, you know, these knot patches on the side. It's not the same light brown and blue pattern that we see elsewhere, but sometimes stairs, just like the doors, are slightly different shades of stone, so we just, I think, have to kind of live with that. This, I suspect, of being a... We saw the weird doors, which we thought were Dowerhand doors, at the other place. So I think that's probably a Longbeard door. Now over here we get these wooden rails. Leading to other doors for some 
odd reason. Yes. It implies. Oh, this... over there, yeah. Yeah. Oh. It implies that this uh, the structure is actually hollow. Yeah. Well, I think that this wooden structure is just like a retaining wall that was built by the by the Longbeards, presumably. I mean, it does connect to those doors, which are Longbeard doors. So, um, um, it is possible now. Uh, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce your name, and I saw no, I noticed neither did my son this afternoon. Um, I'm going to call you Snjorblom, because that's my closest approximation of how to pronounce your name. Um, Snjorblom, that's seriously correct? All right. Okay. Honestly, that's what I thought it was. It's Icelandic. There we go. Um, uh, Snjorblom. Okay. So, see, I was guessing it was, I, I was going to pronounce it Nordic, because that was the only way I could make sense of the J. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Snorri, I can do Snorri. Um, uh, okay, so uh, anyhow, so um, uh, Snorri, yes, it is possible that it could be Firebeard or Broadbeam construction in theory, right? But um, based on the history, now we know that they were in the Arid Lewin, but the 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 Firebeard and Broadbeam dwarves of Nogrod and Belagos were much farther north than this back in the old days. Um, so. Uh, there isn't any a priori reason to think that the dwarves here, even back in the first age, were those dwarves. And based on the in-game story that we're being given, it seems that this southern reach of the Arid Luin was the home of the on both sides of the mountains, right? Um, quite likely, we were at the very least on this side, on the eastern side of the mountains, um, was the Dowerhand place. Um, uh, so anyway. Um, Uh, what was I saying? Okay, so yeah, uh, retaining wall. So I'm thinking that this, this is this the wooden structure here with the like I don't know what is it brass or bronze or something the metal fixtures in the middle and the metal decorations. I think that this looks like a retaining wall to make sure that those that rock cliff face stays in place because it looks kind of cracked and broken there, um, and. You've got another stone wall on top there. Um, and then, of course, you just have goblins squatting, and it doesn't look like the goblins have done anything other than erect their little totem over here. Uh, and presumably these sticks with the shields there, this is goblin stuff too. But this wood is not goblin stuff. You can tell clearly the difference between the wooden structures built by dwarves and the wooden palisades, for instance, this, which was built by goblins. So the goblins are clearly thinking about defending this terrace up here, right? Um, uh, and probably the top of the stairs here, hence the guards, the goblin guards, and the sort of ramshackle half barricade that we get across the entrance here by the goblins. Um, so they're thinking about defending this, which shows this seems to be like a retreat spot or something, maybe this, you know, as well as a place where those goblins down there are um, living in their little tent. And this is a war buggy of theirs, right? It does look like it. I think so. I think so. Clearly not dwarvish anyway. Um, yeah, way uh, too many spikes. Way too many spikes. And way too many wooden spikes. Right? Dwarves don't really seem to do wooden spikes so much. Spikes, perhaps, but they'd be metal spikes. Right? Not not wooden spikes. Not just sharpened sticks. Sharpened sticks mm -hmm. are what dwarves don't seem to do very much of. Okay, so here's another little tower, clearly. Uh, uh, so, in other words, I think... Other than the stairs, which I think might be um, dourhandish, and ooh, look also. No, let's see. Yeah, okay. Other than the stairs, which might be which might be dourhandish, um, dourhandic. What would be the adjective? Dourhandian, dourhandy, dourhandy. Clearly, <laughs> dourhandy. Um, um, uh, long beardish and dourhandy. Definitely. Okay. Um, uh, so we have nothing other than maybe the stairs, the steps, which are, um, uh, uh, which are, uh, which are dour handy. Everything else is, uh, is long beardish. Um, uh, okay. So let's 
continue on to see. We've not yet seen any evidence, uh, any absolute clear drop dead evidence because the steps are only a theory. They could be long beardy or long beardish. Um, yeah, see, this is all long beard clearly down here, that tower. that door. It's possible that this spiky wall, which is also, there's a spiky wall down there, that these spiky walls are dower handy. That's possible. They're not, they're obviously of different stone and older construction than obviously this. They don't look absolutely different from the sta from the stairs. But okay, let's speculate that this spiky also this spiky wall is unusual we've not seen this kind of spiky wall in any i mean all of the tops of the walls of the long beards are all very very flat even where you think they might have walls or or where they have where they might have um uh you know crenellations or something it's just flat right no guardrails or anything yeah the spikes don't actually feel very dwarvish to me of any kind of dwarves. Yeah, I mean, but the, like the general like geometric symmetry of them is kind of dwarfy, um, but yeah, they don't. They definitely don't necessarily fit. I think yeah. So Amethorn was also suspecting that the spiky walls are dour handy. Um, that seems to me likely. In which case, what is beginning to emerge then? Unless the Longbeard's completely obliterated or completely covered over all of the Dower Handy original construction, um, like buildings and things, what we would seem to have then is a series of terraces, and the only thing that looks to be Dower Handy are the stairs and the spiky walls, right? And that would make a kind of sense if they weren't yet living like we haven't yet gotten to the living places, right? To any buildings. This is just like a concentric defense, right? You've got the one set of steps up to the first wall, which is defensible. And then you've got another set of steps offset from the first one, right? Over there, winding around, which comes up to this other, you know, in this other wall with the, with the cliff. And of course, these are goblin up here. Um, mm -hmm. And then we go up, so but we keep going up. We've still all of the towers, all of the standing structures are long beardish. But now we're continuing to go up the steps. And I think I want to dismount my horse at last. I'm not going to need speed from here on out. Um, and the horse's rump just gets in the way when I'm looking around. Um, OK, still all other than perhaps the steps. Um, other than that. Still long beardish, except to our left. And then, yes, that tower on the left, there, left of the arch, seems to be our first clear dower handy construction. Um, the well, that's not a stained glass window, but it looks like it might have been a stained glass window or was a stone relief carved to look like a stained glass window. It's different from the other stained glass window, but it has that same look of the of the frames. I mean, that looks like a that looks almost like a um, a gothic church window, actually. It's the half filigree stuff that we had seen uh, down by the. Uh... Oh, I lost you there, uh, Kind of like where we had formulated our uh, our timeline of who had what in what. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if we look up the hill past that tree, which is now kind of blocking my way, we can see more towers just like this one um, up there. So it seems that we've either come to the place where um, uh, we've either come to the place where the long where the dower hand started to build or where the long beards stopped tearing it down one or the other. Um, 
Yeah, now the goblins have really done nothing other than their little barricades and the occasional totem and tent and pile of rubbish. Uh, so the goblin contribution here is not really much worth considering. Um, once again, the longbeards have consistently replaced any arches or connectors, except he, here's a wall with the classic stained mm -hmm. glass, right? Connected right from that tower. So there's that tower and wall to another dower handy tower back here. And yeah, the, I mean, they're different styles. There certainly is a kind of really clean beauty to the lines of the, you know, the, the smooth marble walls and the, the, all the clean lines and everything. Um, the long beard stuff looks really nice. Um, but there does seem to be a very different kind of sensibility to a structure like this, right? With all of this ornate work and the stained glass and everything else. Not the goblin tent with the skulls, of course, but the wall and tower behind them. Um, okay, so I'm trying to follow the line of the original dower handy architecture around here because we're continuing. It's still one continuous thing off to our left, and then it gets replaced. Then it gets superseded here by... Longbeard architecture, but which of course still retains some of the older ones. And ooh, this is a new one. Hang on, look at this. This is a new piece of dower handish, dower handy architecture. If we come in here, look at oh, this bush is going to be in the way. Hang on, back up, go to first person right there. This one, um, we have. So facing to the south and slightly, you know, sort of uh, south by southeast, um, mm -hmm. we've got that wall with the two colored stained glass windows, which is the first thing that we noticed of Dower Handy architecture before. And then on the right is the towers, like we've seen several times that we, we were noticed coming in. That on the left is new. I don't remember seeing this before. It's clearly of the same style, of the same stone. That central part is what I'm really interested in, because doesn't it look like... Um, a tomb? Or something, right? That I'm looks not... like a door? Or maybe like there was like a relief sculpture there, maybe, or something? Ooh, a statue. Which was, which was either a statue which was taken down, like maybe it's an alcove for a statue which has been removed, or maybe it was a relief sculpture which has been erased right you know has been uh, has been smoothed off or possibly there there looks to be some kind of like elongated runes at the bottom though yeah like in the middle of the doorway uh, i'm not sure if it looks like kind of looks like a baby gate quite frankly but yeah it could be runes without lines oh you mean underneath um still in the the dark archway but toward the bottom of it, at the bottom of it yes yes the... yeah i see kind, that it kind of looks like multiple lines of runes but the but there isn't like a separation between the lines there's no line spacing going on yeah possibly possibly i i i, I see what you're meaning what would you mean there because it doesn't look exactly like the other filigree work that we see anywhere else as just like purely decorative along the edges of things uh -huh. um it, and it does look, especially at the end, this one with the, which looks like a vertical line with a little triangle to the right of it, looks very much mm -hmm. like a runic letter. Um, the one yeah, next see, to it. You can see better if you're on your horse because you get a little bit of elevation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Can't... and if you back up, it kind of looks like a, a door, a, like a miniature door. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because I don't see any evidence of actual door. I mean, it looks solid. Right. I know. Okay. But Actually, looking up on my horse, it looks less like runes because the things which looked like letters, mm -hmm. those patterns are repeated. So it begins to look more like a, 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 a series of repeating pattern, geometric yeah. patterns rather than a rather than runes. But um, but still, again, not something that we've seen. I mean, the um, in some ways, of course, like from an architectural standpoint, the design of the Longbeard stuff is kind of 
more sophisticated and it's more harmonious, right? Whereas the dower hand stuff is this like really interesting, but kind of dizzying mishmash of different patterns, right? Kind of like yeah, a yeah. kind of somebody like, like somebody making a sign that uses like eight different fonts, right? You know, and, and so you're looking and you're like, whoa, right? Um, this is sort of similar. I mean, we get so many different patterns all kind of, you know, juxtaposed together without any obvious, um, without any obvious pattern. But that, that is interesting. The whole thing, I mean, the whole structure there, the whole little substructure, uh, or big substructure, actually. Um, if, if I just saw that freestanding, I would think it was, it was a crypt. It looks like a crypt, perhaps. Um, I don't think that that means that that's necessarily what it is, but, uh, but it is interesting that it kind of looks that way. It does look like a door there. Um, if it was an alcove for some kind of idol, or if it was a, a, a representative of something dour handy, I can see why they would efface that, you know, why they'd get rid of that, the, the long beards mm -hmm. when they took right. over. But the archway is too tall for something dwarfish, though. It, it's man tall, quite frankly. Maybe. But again, it could just be, we don't know the scale of what it was. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. just be a statue, like, um, and again, we don't know exactly know the proportions, right? It could have been a fairly broad as well as tall statue. So it could have been a big dwarf, right? Um, a giant dwarf, um, uh, to use a, a fun uh, <laughs> yeah, phrase. I'm just thinking in terms of the shape of the actual alcove within the structure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. But but again, I think it could just as well be a, uh, be a carving rather than only a, um, an alcove. Not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, let's see. And certainly dwarves do go for outsized statuary, as we see in Moria, Edith. You're absolutely right. Um, so there's no reason to think if it was a statue that it would have been a small statue and, and uh, you know, uh, anything near to the scale of an actual dwarf. Um so some of the dower hand stuff they've just left. It does seem to tend to be stuff in the background like that, right? I don't think we've yet seen um, long beard stuff. No, what's down here? Go off the cliff. Oh, it's a cliff. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So there's just a path to a cliff. Wow, and quite a cliff. All the. The chief did just survey his uh, menu. Yeah. I mean, I can see that this would be useful for definished. Yeah, for chucking stuff off of. Exactly, Tor Marthen. Um, oh, this is going to be one of those goblins that keeps shrieking long after you kill him, isn't he? Yes, it they is. They are. And you can tell. Goblins screaming from the grave, as usual. Um, Presumably the Longbeards, when they made this arch, this is just like a lookout spot, right? Yeah, probably just uh, for where your scouts hang out and uh, keep an eye on the valley. Right, right. And probably, coming backwards, probably can access the top. No, it's not obvious that there's access on the top, except the goblins seem to have built a fire up there. So presumably you can get there somehow. Um, but yeah, so okay. I'm puzzled why the goblins put a palisade inside these walls, though. Yeah. I mean, did they hate the architecture that much? Right. Like, we can't bear it. We just want to see sharpened sticks. Yeah. I feel more comfortable and surrounded by large sharpened sticks. Um, yeah. Thinking of D and D alignments in terms of architecture, who's chaotic good, who's lawful. Right. Chaotic right. Evil. Right. Um. Yeah, I don't know why they line the walls with palisades. Um, I mean, I could see it for this gate here. I mean, yeah, you know, that that makes sense. But along the wall, it's like, is there something hiding? Here? Right, right. Yeah, not really sure. Um, okay, and yeah, we can still see. Nope, not there. That's all long beard behind. But again, looking up from here, look at that. It's all dour handy up there. 
So we've come to that. We've come, so this le, this level that we're on seems to be the beginning of the main dower hand construction from the old days. And then we come up here and we see much more of it. Look, this whole archway, right? The, they've bolstered the bottom of it, but we've got this whole little terrace. And look at that. Ooh, that's another thing. Look at the rose window. Yes, I, I did just notice that. Yeah, there's a Very rose neo, window in there. Wow, yeah. That's really cool. And then all the way up around the top, I mean, this is the main... The main seems to be the main city, at least the main above ground version of the city. And they're like interspersing them over here. Yes, yes. It's like geology. Yeah, this this may exactly it was the dower hand strata, and then the the long beards built on top, mm -hmm, and then the. Mm -hmm. Um, I suspect that this is the dower hands building over a level, or the sorry, the long beards rather building over a level. Um. Uh, Could it represent more than one change of power? I doubt it, uh, because that would imply that dower hands were constructing in that mode after the Longbeards came. But I think that these uh, dower hand constructions all come from the 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 primary dower hand period before the the uh, betrayal of Scorgrim. Before Scor Scorgrim's betrayal, I should say. Um, so I wouldn't think they would have had the opportunity to come back and construct more after that. I think it must just be, for some reasons, whether they be structural or whether they be aesthetic, uh, the dower, the long beards, I keep saying the wrong thing, were like, okay, yeah, let's just, um, we're gonna, this middle, um, this middle layer, we're gonna, um, we're gonna cover over. Maybe maybe the old one was broken and looked ugly, and so they were like, "Well, we'll keep the ones that look nice, but that middle one had some serious problems, and so we're gonna uh, we're gonna replace it, and therefore also strengthen the wall so that the whole top doesn't collapse." Um, is the kind of thing I'm thinking because it would have been old. I mean, it would have been centuries old by the time they got mm -hmm. here. Some of it is gonna need to be uh, um, some of it is gonna need to be uh, 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 reinforced, like structurally reinforced. Okay, so this was clearly the primary, not just plaza. And notice how the evidence here suggests that their main city was clearly not above ground. We have this area over here to the northeast, right? Which seems to be mm -hmm. more or less freestanding. But most of it, like th these walls over here, there's not whole buildings behind these walls. These walls are set against the rock, just like these over here are. And even, yeah, yeah, th these all, this, these all over here, which suggests to me that the primary city was inside the mountain here. And, but they did build this like facade on the outside, um, with perhaps even windows that came to, that you could come to see out of from inside the mountain, right? Um, mm -hmm. so that this, Rather than being a, uh, rather than being a primary, um, like building center, right, was instead only like the primary plaza surrounded by their buildings. And yeah, that the Longbeards have done almost nothing up here apart from those interspersed layers. Exactly. This is their front porch to our Martha. And that's just right. And then. We have a mostly collapsed slit in the rock here. This entrance is enormously disappointing after how grand and beautiful all the rest of this is. Then we come to the entrance in and we get, well, okay, we get these two towers, which presumably had an arch in between them. In fact, we can see it, right? Um mm -hmm. Which is interesting because almost all of the arches have been replaced by, um, by longbeard arches almost everywhere else where we've seen where a dower hand arch would certainly have to have been, right? But here we can just see the remnants of what an actual dower hand arch would have been. And that's this what looks like metal. 
uh, angular opening with, with these little almost runic designs there. And then the big collapsed stone on the inside. So there was a stone fall, presumably, that wrecked the gate. And therefore the entrance to Sarnur was cut off. So if I had to guess from the outside, and here I am completely guessing because I only was in Sarnur very briefly on two occasions and I died very swiftly both times, so I've <laughs> never explored Sarnur because um, I was always soloing when I was in this area. Um, uh, if I had to guess, based on the evidence we see out here, what I would expect to find inside is... Um, I would expect to find almost entirely dower hand architecture with little or no long beard influence because it look because the, the long beards have not cleared and built an arch here. You'd expect, even if they kept the towers, you'd expect a long beardish arch, right? Uh, and a cleared path, not the, just the cave entrance here. Right. So, that's what I would expect to see if the Longbeards had really set up shop inside and done a lot of renovations inside. Now, I may end up being wrong about that, but that's what I would expect to see. Um, this slit probably implies that it's only recently that this opening was rediscovered um, and uh, that maybe this place was used as a place of defense by the Long... You know, was prepared as a place of defense by the Longbeards, um, but mm -hmm. they didn't really go to the stuff that was inside here. So, um, trifle, uh, suggests that, uh, this is perhaps, uh, we're seeing why all the dower hand arches have been replaced because they're neither very attractive nor apparently very sturdy. So, um, that certainly seems very likely. Sorry. The last bit was my extrapolation, but yes, uh, it is possible that we're seeing why they were just why they were, uh, replaced. And by the way, notice, notice the spikes. The spikes look very similar to the spikes that are on the spiky walls. So I think our conclusion about the spiky walls being dower handy uh, is uh, yeah, they uh, are is being uh, corroborated here. Okay, cool. Well, there's definitely not work on here, so it's definitely not goblin. Yes, it's definitely not goblin. Okay, um, well, it is super late, uh, so I should let people go. Um, so glad I got a chance to look at this place in more detail. Um, uh, we'll see maybe if we have the uh, wherewithal to go inside uh, next week, we can do that. Uh, if we don't, we can continue exploring Overland and come back here a different time. Um, but um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how things look next week, um, depending on the levels of folks we've got with us. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining me for class and our field trip tonight. And I will see you guys again next week if I don't see you sooner at Middlemoot in Iowa this coming weekend. So thanks, everybody. Good night now. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.